This is A's Cast Live, your comprehensive look at the Oakland Athletics. Rooker, it's a fly ball to deep center. Robert going back at the track. He will turn and watch it fly. And 29 other MLB clubs. Adolis Garcia sends on the other way. That sends Carroll back. He's at the wall. And the legend grows. Well, Acuna, another milestone in a truly historic season. Julio, with an absolute nuke out to left. It's Glaber Day, and like a good Glaber, Torres is there. Join us as we take you inside the baseball universe, from humidors to Stuff Plus <laughs> to walk-off dingers. We have you covered. Spend your afternoon with us, only on 80s Cast Live. Here's Chris Townsend. Good afternoon, everybody. We've got a road trip. Where's my guy, Road Trip Mike? He's going to be out there on the road. I'm excited. You excited? Nothing like Cleveland, New York, and Baltimore. This is a legit road trip. Why? Because Cleveland and Steve Avote, they're looking to win 14 of their first 20 games for only the third time in the wild card era. Vote's guardians are hot. You're going into the Bronx, and then you take on the Baltimore Orioles, which I still think are the team to beat in the American League East. I I mean, just going through some numbers today, even with the bad start, the A's bullpen is third best in baseball. It's a game that's now about bullpens. It's third best. And if the A's can just start hitting a little bit, I mean, if they hit a little bit, this team would be 500. They'd be one of the biggest shocks of baseball so far. You'd have everybody going, "Uh uh-oh, we didn't didn't read that one right. But there's something to watch here, and this is going to be a great test because normally you'd be like, oh, boy, they got to go on the road. Well, you know what? That's what we thought in Detroit and Texas. And actually getting away from Oakland was something that was good for the team. And they flourish, winning two out of three in both places. Let's see what they do now. What if they go in and win two out of three in Cleveland? You're going to be like, damn, this is interesting. Because all of a sudden, you start taking that bad, bad start away. They've only lost one series. Yeah, and they're 5-1 and one in series finales, which is very, I mean, that's great for a team that now has eight wins. I went back and looked, and you know, to show you that, just look back at how bad last year was. They, they teamed to win their eighth game until May sixth of last year. Yeah, I don't even want to think about that. I know, but I'm saying that I just. You, like, I gotta let that. You gotta let it go. What was that? May May sixth was when they when team won their eighth game. We have yeah, eight already, you, and it's April nineteenth. Yeah, you just don't want to relive that garbage anymore. It was horrific. Last year was absolutely horrific. We got a great show for you today. The leader of men, Fran Reardon, is here. Here, get, give us the guest. Uh, we got Fran Reardon coming up at 1.30. Vegas at home. Uh, I believe they won last night. Vegas they, is terrible. Uh, they're not having a great start to no. the year. No, not so much. Daryl Hernandez went is now down there, hit a home run last night. Which, by the way, I know a lot of people may double take on that. That's something that I know... A couple of us were talking about off the air. I think we talked a little bit about on the air. But for Hernays, really the best scenario for him, because now he can go play every day. He's not going to play every day. And now that you have Schumann who can play short, Hernays needs to go play every day and get at bats. Because he could be not far away from being the everyday shortstop if Nick Allen doesn't hit. And if Nick Allen doesn't hit, well, then who's going to hit? And that could be Daryl Hernandez. But sitting on the bench, playing some short, playing some third, not playing all the time, that's not good for him at his age. He needs to play every day. This is a good call. Get Hernandez down there playing every single day. Now that Toro is hitting, and, you know, it was J.D. Davis solidified himself as the, it was really one game of two home runs. And they were like, oh, J.D. Davis, but. You know, now Toro playing third base. And we can't say enough. Sorry. Sorry, Toro. Sorry we doubted. 
So, yeah. yeah. Sorry we doubted. Sorry, it's our fault. It's our fault. We'll own it. We'll own it. But Toro, so right now, he's going to play. Didn't lead off tonight. Playing third. We'll get into the lineup because it is interesting. Yes. But we'll get into the lineup. But the Hernays going to talk to Fran Reardon. And the great thing about talking about Fran is what did they say? Because every player comes down with, with a report from the front office. Work on this. Do this with this guy. What was the report for Hernays? And then we'll get in. Hey, Joey Estes, numbers haven't looked great, but you can't look at numbers with pitchers in Vegas. So a lot to get into with the leader of men, Fran Reardon. But his ball club, it's not very good. Yeah, uh, Joey Estes actually pitched last night, too. So uh, Fran Reardon at 130. We're going to have the voice, Forcey Frick nominee. Didn't get it this time, but Tom Hamilton will be on with us at 2 o'clock. We, Swung on and belted. I mean, we love having Tom on. He's one of our favorite oh, Guardian guests. Uh, he is Tom Hamilton. If I lived in Cleveland or Ohio and you were a Guardian slash Indians fan all these years, what a treat to listen to him every night. He is phenomenal. And if you watch Quick Pitch on MLB Network, his highlights are the best. They're the best. The passion, the energy. I mean, all the years doing hoops, football for the Big Ten Network. Um, Tom Hamilton, he will get the Ford C. Frick Award. He will be one of the broadcasters in the Baseball Hall of Fame. He's he's awesome. And the best guy. The yeah, nicest great. guy. He uh, It'd be great if he gets the Ford C. Frick down the road when, uh, when his good friend Hosey maybe goes into the Hall of Fame. That'd be Jose Ramirez. Maybe he and Ken they, Cor- Why don't we put these guys in together? That's yeah. I mean, I think that's the way we have to go because they've right? every couple why, of years. Why don't we? Why don't? Why don't we put? Why don't we put like him and Korak? I mean, Crook and Kai. People I've heard say, yeah, they should go in together. I'm like, I'm good with that. Like honoring just one guy gets in. These guys are not young. I hate to tell you, forty and fifty year olds don't get nominated for the Ford C Frick. C- correct. Right. I mean, these guys who get nominated are all like 70s, late 60s. Let's honor these guys while they're alive, right? Let's honor them while their families can be there and they can enjoy it. And, and you know, let's do that. Bill King's a great yeah, example. Now, Bill obviously, King. the way Bill passed surgery, that <clears throat> that uh, didn't go well. But just that's, a, that's an example. Let's Let's get the greats in while they're alive. So we all can enjoy it, right? Get Korak in. Get 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 Tom Hamilton. In. Get all these guys in. Kruk and Kai will throw them some love. Yeah, then Joe Castiglione, the Red Sox voice of, on radio, is going in this year. So I'm with you 100%. We're going to have uh, Stephen Kwan on. Uh, we actually taped this interview what, during the first weekend, and we never yeah. had a chance to actually play it on the show. So we'll talk with uh, Fremont's own, Washington High's own Stephen Kwan, and then uh, Mark Kotze for the Mark Kotze show coming up at 3 o'clock. Here's a great example. Tom Hamilton will be 70 in August. He doesn't look it. No, not at all. But he doesn't sound like it. He'll be 70 in August. Why, why are we waiting on this? I right? think it's every three years. I thought go... they did it every year. They don't no. do it every year? I, I'd have to look. I thought it was every three years. I mean, uh, it's going to be 70 years old. Korak's in his 70s. Like, these guys should be all getting in. Kirk and Kuyper both in their 70s. Maybe it is every year. I thought it was that. I don't like. I thought Dwayne, it was Dwayne Kuyper is the old. You, you know what people don't know? And just because we worked with Glenn for all these years, Dwayne is the oldest of all the Giants broadcasters. You wouldn't know it. You would, everybody think, well, obviously, John Miller. Dwayne Kuyper came up in the Indian system way back when with Dennis Eckersley. Yeah. Right? He and Eck played minor league ball together. He played, <laughs> he played with a younger Ray Fossey. So that shows you Dwayne's up there. Dwayne's probably. I think he's 74 if I had to guess off the top of my head. Yeah, he is not like, oh, he's just 70. Because Kruko's. Kruko's Kruk a lot younger than Kruko's Kruk like 71 or two. And even. I think he's even younger than that. Let's see. How old is. I'm then I'm going to look up John Miller. I think Miller's. John Miller's just like 70 or 70. Kruko's 72. Okay, so coming this June, Kuiper will be 74. Yeah, and John Miller's 72. Now, John Miller's already in. Now, he should be. I mean, John Miller was the voice of the Orioles. He was the voice 
Now I've been the voice of the Giants. So he was the voice of baseball, Sunday Night Baseball. Yeah, was, yeah. He was the voice of the World Series for ESPN. He did all that for like 20-something years. He should be in, right? Honor a great early. right? Crook and Kite, get him in. Korak, get him in. Tom Hamilton, who we're going to have on today, get him in. We got some big news going on today. Verlander's going to make his debut. Jordan Montgomery is going to make his debut. We saw Jake Leiter, Al Leiter's kid, make his debut. What's the first thing you noticed about his debut yesterday? Uh, I didn't. I didn't actually get a chance to watch him pitch. I just gave up a lot of runs. First pitch, poof! What is it on the radar gun? Everybody, who was it on the radar gun? I'll say ninety-eight. It's a higher. I mean, than it's that. just like, it's like, oh my god! I, I was thinking a lot about this, and I, I, I did not want to. I'm not not going to start the show with this. I'm going to start the show on the A's. But I just, I want people to know that your body naturally does things. And your your body naturally has strengths, right? You naturally, and Verlander said this in that uh, podcast that you, you played on, on our show, where Verlander said when he was younger, he didn't throw as hard, but his body matured into what he became. Nolan Ryan matured into my Nolan Ryan was blowing gas in high school, but yeah, the same thing. Clemens, like anybody you think is a power pitcher, Randy Johnson, they matured naturally into what they became. So their bodies were, were able to withstand it. We now want to unnaturally get these kids to throw harder than they've ever before spin it more than they've ever been able to spin it. It's not natural. It's not their natural progression. It's like what we see with sprinters sprinters. You go out there, you're a world-class spinner. This is how fast you run. But then what we're going to do is we're going to do everything we can to make you run, have your body run faster than it naturally does. And what happens with sprinters? They're always hurt. Sprinters are always getting hurt, whether it's hamstrings, it's thighs, it's hips, because we're asking your body to do more than it naturally is able to do, right? We see it in golf when these kids are swinging. I mean, one of the worst things you could do for your body is play golf. It's a horrible sport for your body. It's horrible for your back, your spine. There's so many things wrong with it, but so many of us love playing it, but it's really bad for you. We talked to Mark Kotze today off the air. They went play golf. I'm like, Kotze, you play golf? Yeah, I'm kind of easing back in because – you know, Kotze's had major back surgery. He's got a bad back. But now these kids are unnaturally trying to hit his front, and they're getting hurt. They're getting hurt. When you unnaturally try and do something your body is not made to do, you're going to subject yourself to injury. That's the way we need to look at this thing going forward with these pitching labs and all these different ply- – the heavy balls, the light balls, the plyo balls, and everything that they're doing. We're trying to unnat- – if you naturally throw – 93, 94, and you go to the lab and you're going to try and get everything out of gravity and, and utilizing ground forces and using your body and doing everything. And now you get to 97, 98. Well, that's not natural. And what we're seeing is a lot of the pitcher's bodies can't take it. Once I've taken you out of what your body naturally does and I try and get you to a place beyond that, sounds great, right? Hey, man, I can increase three, four miles an hour. I can create X amount of spin. I can, sounds great, and it is great. It's just your body can't handle it because that's not natural movement for your body. Guys like Nolan Ryan were able to pitch forever throwing that hard because that was natural for his body. He didn't have enhancements, right? He didn't do PEDs. He didn't go to throw labs. He didn't do any of that. So it sounds great when I'm going to turn you into a better player. We got to do X, Y, and Z. It's just, can your body handle it? And we're finding out a lot of people can't. So the question will be long-term. This is the question. Front offices, down to colleges, down to the amateur level. At what point are you going to allow athletes to just to naturally get better? Work out, eat right train, do all that. But when you really specifically, specifically try and, 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 and zoom in on like one thing of throwing the baseball, just throwing this harder. When are we not going to be addicted to that? Cause we're addicted to it. Front offices right now, you know, like when we had, Eno know, on, 
And I said, Eno, your stuff plus, but your stuff plus is hurting people. And I said, well, you know, hey, I know a lot of people have said that, but hey, I'm just an analyst. Don't don't shoot me for just, well, it's like the front offices. I, I, I'm I just telling you, you know, we're, we're in a swing and miss era. Like all we care about is swing and miss. That's all we want to swing. We don't want the ball put in play. We're in a swing and miss time in baseball. Well, the ramifications of the swing and miss era, if we had the drug era of the 80s, the PEDs of the 90s and 2000s, right now we're in the swing and miss era. Or we're in the Tommy, we're in the true, I guess we, Tommy John's been around, we call it the UCL era. But this is swing and miss era, and it's causing a lot of injuries because we're asking guys to do stuff that's not natural for their bodies. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's interesting. You mentioned that I didn't get a chance to read it yet, but I saw that um, I believe we had Steven Nesbitt on before he used to cover the pirates for the athletic. Now he's a national writer for the athletic, but he wrote an article about Mason Miller and how Mason Miller went from having a failed drug screening and getting diagnosed with diabetes to being the hardest thrower in baseball. And I haven't got a chance to read it yet, but I saw that saw it on the athletic. Like it just shows you a guy that wasn't throwing hard has now trained his body into being the hardest thrower in baseball. Is that what it says? Well, I mean, I'm saying he's... Because that's not really what happened. No, but... He was a diabetic and didn't know. Yeah, this was saying. He, he mentioned, like, the thing said, like, the he found a, diagno- a diabetes diagnosis. Yeah, so what happens is, is your body, you have it, your, your, your pancreas is no longer making insulin. So all of a sudden, you have a disease that you're going to have for the rest of your life. He's a type 1 diabetic. And same thing as my daughter. And all of a sudden, your body is in chaos. He's going out there, a Mason Miller, no weight, feels horrible, no energy, doesn't have any of that. And he can't figure out why. And then all of a sudden, you do figure it out. You're able to control it. You're able to deal with your insulin because your pancreas is not making insulin anymore. And you go through the process that a diabetic goes through. And all of a sudden you gain your strength, you gain all of that. And then all of a sudden Mason Miller's body starts working. So so point is Mason Miller didn't get 103. This is more natural for Mason Miller. This is what his body healthy looks like. The, the Mason Miller going to college and not not being diagnosed yet as a diabetic, that wasn't healthy. That wasn't natural. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I guess I would be a little sensitive of that because of my daughter. I, if someone just wrote an article saying, well, look at Mason Miller. Mason Miller's body got healthy, and that's why he's Mason Miller now. Yeah, it's an article. And he's told us that on Ace Cast Live. Yeah, it's an article I want to check out because they mentioned, like I said, they, in the title, he mentioned the diabetes diagnosis and all this. So I want to see how they kind of weave all that together into where he's at now, because um, we know that we know the story, but it's the it's do the, the, the fans outside of the A's circle know the story of Mason Miller. This is a great test, this road trip. And remember when I told it, I, I don't know if you got to listen to post game, but after the A's won the last game, the day game, I said, you know what? This is a great win for the A's to win another series. And I also said, I'm impressed by the Nats. By the way, they're leaving town, but I'm impressed by the Nats. If you watch those three games, they got a little spunk. And they got some athleticism. And they've got some young players. And they're going to run all over you. I love what we are seeing in baseball right now. By the way, what did the Nats do? Nats took two out of three from the Giants, came to Oakland, lost two out of three. What did the Nats do after that? Uh, I know they played the Dodgers. They, did they have winning two or three? They won two or three. I know they lit up glass now the one night. They won two of three. So you go on a road trip to the West Coast, two or three from San Francisco, two or three from the Athletics, and two or three from the Dodgers? Uh, pretty successful, Dave Martinez. I was I'm telling you, watching them play for three days, I went, this is a team that you would not love to play. They put a tremendous amount of pressure on your defense. And the A's are going to see that again today because you got Steven Vogt and the running guardians. These guys are going to run. This is an athletic team. This is a team that's hot. 
when we talk about all the time, right? What happens when you start gaining confidence in life? You start gaining confidence, you start getting belief. You know who's got belief? The vote coats. I love that, by yeah. the way. It's a great but jacket. Is, is it still sold out? Uh, I haven't looked, but um, I remember it sold out within minutes. So, yeah, It's the bomber jackets that everybody yeah. has. Like, it's a lot of money for one of them, and they sold out like that, like, like that. Well, you know the thing about the vote coat, which is, and I guess you could throw this with, like, the Yankees. Who else? It's a navy blue coat, right? It kind of goes... It kind of goes with everything. Like you can wear it out other than the ballpark and not look like you're wearing just some MLB merch. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm going to try to. I'll, I guess the twins would be that way. I'm just trying to think of all the teams that would have the have the navy blue, a darker kind of, it almost looks dressier. I mean, ours is, it's green, right? Yes. I mean, it is what it is. It's green. The Dodgers is this light blue. I mean, I'm not wearing a light blue bomber jacket. Like, really? So the fact that it's a navy blue has more of a, a dressier look. Uh, it's not coming up on here. Uh, maybe it's sold, sold out, maybe baby. Maybe it's still sold out. I mean, there is a jacket on here that's uh, it's called the Men's Cleveland Guardian Starter Navy Secret Weapon Full Snap jacket that's it's not the secret same one. weapon jacket. yeah because it has <laughs> guardians on the back yeah it's uh it's that... not as nice it's not even close to the same price either no <laughs> but the vote coats you got to watch out cleveland is batting 318 with runners in scoring position that's the second best in all baseball they're doing it all and now they're back home i i i I'm really interested in seeing what the attendance is like I always call it Jacobs Field. What the hell is it called? Now? Progressive Field. Progressive Field. Jacobs Field, it should be called. The Jake. And, you know, they just put it on Oakland in that in that first four-game set. Winning three of four and outscoring the A's 29 to 11. So let's see what the A's got. I kind of like it. And then you go to New York. And it's not old Yankee Stadium. There's no, there's no there there like there used to be, but it's still New York. You're still... You know, I don't know how many of these kids have even been to New York before, but you're still getting on those buses in Manhattan and you're going over to New York and you're like, damn, this city's big and there's people everywhere. It's New York City. Then you go there and it's the monuments and it's the Yankees. You're going to see what real media looks like. Like all of a sudden there's media everywhere on the field. They're everywhere. And I'm sure we're going to have media creeping over into our clubhouse asking questions. Asking questions probably for the first time in a couple of years, right? Like, there's been no reason for the New York media to go into the A's clubhouse. Like, there's been no reason. Now there may be. They may be coming in going, hey, how are you guys feeling? What do you guys think? Even though our players aren't going to have any dynamic answers, but they may they may want to talk to Kotze. They may want to, like, ask around. Hey, you're going to be playing at Sacramento for three years. Then it's Vegas. So, so this is a story. So this might, so all of a sudden our young players might be like, Hey, I'm so-and-so from the New York times, you know, papers that still exist, TV cameras that they're going to be, that when you go to Yankee stadium, you now see like there's media, like the media media has, unfortunately, this is our world media has kind of died around the country. You're not get. you go to Texas, you go to where you're not getting, it's not like. The, it's not like the Northeast. The Northeast still has a strong media presence. You're still going to have writers. You're going to now they now you have the blogger world. You've got I mean, there's a lot of people who cover the Yankees. Don't forget John Boy. They'll be there, too. You're going to have all yeah, John Boy is a great example, right? It's a new style of media. We're a new style. Technically, we're 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 we, we're the team's outlet. So you wouldn't call us media, but it's this kind of, you know. Take, take take the biggest shows there are. Whether you look at Dan Patrick or you look at Pat McAfee, none of these started traditionally on television, right? They were they did not start that way. Now they're getting on the mainstream what well, cable, but they weren't they didn't start that way. So there's a lot of non traditional. Point of the matter is, is our <laughs> players are gonna gonna get that. You're gonna see it. Welcome to New York, Taylor Swift. Welcome to New York. 
Oh, I was like, it's been waiting for you. Uh, I got Swifties in my house. I well, know new, new, new album came out last uh, this, this morning or today. So that's nice. all my wife's been listening to. So they're going to get to see it. And how do you line up? You, you said Soto couldn't play anymore. Soto seems to be all right. Uh, they seem to be doing it. Anthony Volpe's having his breakout year. And everyone was worried about him replacing Jeter. They're John Jeter. Carlos Stanton is healthy. And he's hitting. Like that that's kind of a story for them. Carlos Rodon's pitching well. The fact that John Carlos year. Stanton, they've paid him all that money. He's actually staying it's early. Knock on wood for that guy. It's early, but he's what the other night is fifth home run in Toronto. How's Glaber Day doing? I don't think he's a home run still. He stinks. You want him? <laughs> you want him? <laughs> But yeah, they're playing well. You want to know what Glaber Day's doing? That's funny. I can tell you exactly what Glaber Day's doing. I wish I could get rid of this guy. He's at 208, no home runs, two RBIs. Oh, and he's he was hitting in the top half of the order, I'm pretty sure. Went one for four, two runs scored, and stolen base on Saturday in the win in game two against Cleveland. Also drew a walk. He's terrible. He's terrible. What do I do with him? So you want him? No, I'm good. I wish I could put C.J. Abrams. I got C.J. Abrams on the bench. Well, you can put him in over Glaber Day. No, I can't. He's a shortstop. That's that is oh, a, Glaber's playing second. That's that right. is a flaw with fantasy baseball. Saying so, in a, in a, in a, in a <laughs> talk about getting off on a tangent in a time when we're all about versatility, right? Everybody, how many players in baseball will only play one position all year? Not many. Now, first baseman, because you're an infielder and you only have one spot to play when you're left-handed, right? You throw lefty. But how many guys will only, he will only play shortstop. He will only play second base. He will only play center field. So really first base and catcher. But how many, how many guys will only play that position all year long and never play anywhere else? Maybe some. Maybe there'll be some third basemen. I say there's a couple third basemen popped in my head. Couple, some shortstops, maybe, maybe some center fields. But for the most outfielders, everybody plays everywhere. Yeah, I mainly thought of first baseman and third baseman that don't they only play those positions. Like I don't think. Well, Gold, I don't lot, think Goldschmidt's gonna be lining up anywhere else. A lot of third basemen will go over and play first base at one point during the season. But you don't allow me to put them in fantasy. Certain leagues, certain I think Yahoo does it. Maybe like if a guy has a certain amount of um, innings played somewhere, they're out, like like Henry Davis is a good case. The Pirates catcher, he was also an outfield eligible because he played outfield last year, so he came up as an outfielder. But he he's played five games a catcher, so he's not as a catcher and an outfielder. Hey, uh, where's your French Cuban? He's hurt. Yeah, when's he coming back? I, is he hitting three hundred or not, or or, or oh ninety for the White Sox? Because. Uh... <laughs> French they're, they're, Cuban was hitting 214 with two home runs. He's on my IL. Oh, Luis Robert. The, 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 the guy you call Robert. The, what, are, what are the White Sox now? Three and 15 they're or terror. something like that? Hey. They they might. Hey. We know what that's like. We were just there. Marlins, White Sox. We know exactly. We know your Rockies, pain. We, we know your pain. We were just there. We were just there. Don't want to go back. Then, so great test against the vote coats. They're going to run, they're athletic, and they're hot, and they believe. All right. Then you're going to New York. Always good to go there and, and get to see it. And and I like going there at the beginning of the year. Like, you go there now. So your young players get to see it now. Like, wow. That's just learning experience, right? And then, whack, you go to Baltimore. Is there any hotter place in baseball than Baltimore? I would go probably not. No, like everything going on around them, they've got like a they they're they're like a locomotive that's get like everything's going like their ballpark stuff got situated, their ownership group thing got situated. They got all these players. It's just like this is a, and that's why it was like in the off season when all when you know Cody Cody being from the East Coast is a Yankee honk too. So all these Yankee honks were picking the Yankees to win everything. I'm like, didn't Baltimore win like 103? Would they win 103? 101. 101. They won the division. Like, why would they not be the team to beat? Why would they not be the team to beat? 
everyone said that. Then they got Corbin Burns. Like, oh, I still think the Yankees are the team to beat. And he, it's like, what? Like, are, do, do they you, just added a frontline starter that they didn't have last year. And they're taking, and they have the number one prospect in baseball. I know Jackson Holiday's one for 25 with 14 strikeouts, but uh, a lot of them those swinging. Maybe he, can, he needs to get that right. But other than that, the, the Orioles are playing. How's that start? I uh, remember how big that. Oh, it's the biggest debut. It's the greatest debut we've ever seen. One, Cannot wait. One for 25. Cannot wait. Then we built up Jack Leiter. Cannot wait. Would Leiter give up seven runs yesterday? Seven, yeah. It's not great. What's Holiday hitting? Like 41? Something like that. <laughs> one for 25. 14 strikeouts so far to start the year. Oh, man. Hey, by the way, is this the Bills year? Well, is no, this going to be the Bills year? No Stephon Diggs anymore, so I don't know. Hey, we, we, hey, you're the with us, you're against us. Our team, our town. Buffalo, New York, baby. <laughs> That's how I view it. We're circling the wagons. How's Fran feel about it? It's off season, the big off season, Fran. This has got to be the year. It's got to be the year. I, I've said for the last thirty years. <laughs> hey, it wasn't that long ago you had four straight tries at it back in the good old days. Um, the early nineties was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was in college. I. I <laughs> I remember throwing these massive Super Bowl parties, and I'm thinking, hey, man, you got Bruce Smith and you got Daryl Talley, their defense. Oh. I mean, but, like you know, like 10 Hall of Famers on those teams. Oh, my God. Marv Levy. It was a great, I mean, some great epic moments of Buffalo Bills back in the day. Those were great. I mean, to think about four straight years going to the Super Bowl, the grind, the, the not having the same offseason as everybody else has, to, to dominating your conference for four straight years. That was, tr I mean, that truly, truly amazing. I'll never forget that. I, I hope someday they truly get their due because going to four straight Super Bowls is incredible. Well, it was incredible. There, there was so much fun to watch, and it seemed like every every year in that four-year span, they got to the Super Bowl, and they turned into a different team. They weren't the same team, the high-flying, run-and-gun, uh, you know, passing, running, everything, good defense. They, they just stopped being that team for those four games and, you know, did, didn't, turn out, didn't turn out great. How are you doing? How's the start of the year going? Well, wins and losses wise, it hasn't been great, but I mean, we're, we're working hard here. There's been a lot of bright spots and, uh, you know, just, just, uh, enjoying trying to get these guys ready for the big leagues every day. Yeah. That's so interesting. Your job, like your job is to get these guys ready for when they get called up. So when they get called up that they can help the, the big club win, but yet you're competitive as hell and you want to win games, right? It's a, it's a, it's an interesting job. Well, I mean, it's, I, to me, it's part of the development. It's part of the the mentality that we're trying to create here in AAA. So when they go there, they're winning major league players. Um, so the the winning part is no small part of their development. I mean, obviously, there's sp specific things for each player and what they're working on. But as a group and, you know, what we're trying to do every day, we're trying to do all of our work before the game. And once 7 o'clock starts, go out and try to do the little things to win every night. Yeah, winning is an attitude. Absolutely. And it's it's contagious and it, it builds closeness and camaraderie and, and cohesion and chemistry and um it's it's infectious. And that's that's what we're trying to to get to here and we're trying to gain some traction towards that end. So yesterday, all of a sudden we're we're kind of looking at what's going on down in Vegas and we see Daryl Hernandez is there. We're like, oh, he just left us. Um I thought it was a really good move because he, he's a bright young kid. He's got a he's got a very interesting future. Up here, he wasn't getting a lot of at bats, so I always wonder like, how are you going to progress by not playing? So when he comes down, what is the idea that you guys want to work on with him down at AAA? Well, I th I think you nailed it. Just just regular playing time, being in there every day, getting four or five at bats, hitting at the top of the order. Um, getting getting more reps at third base, uh, you know, keeping him comfortable at shortstop and just getting at bats under his belt and stacking games and stacking hits and stacking quality at bats. And, he, you know, he's he's still very young, but he's hungry. You know, he, he got optioned and he was in Vegas the same night of the game 
that he just played in Oakland hours earlier, and he was in the lineup yesterday and hit a two-run home run, which turned out to be the difference in the game, in his second at-bat back. So coming down here with the right mindset doesn't surprise me. That's the kind of player, that's the kind of person Daryl is. But to see him have such a dramatic effect in our win last night was just uh, kind of refreshing and, and a lot of fun to watch. When you watch him play defensively, where do you think his best fit is? Well, I, I I think that with a little bit more refinement, he could be an everyday major league shortstop. I don't think he's at that point yet, um, but he's athletic enough to do it. He can certainly play, you know, third base, second base. Uh, you know, I don't want to I don't want to coin him as a utility player because I think he's much more than that, but. He's very hungry to, to learn. He's very hungry to work. And he's got a, a strong desire to play shortstop at the major league level. And I, I, never, I never count out the motivation of a player if he has a single-minded a single goal. And I know Daryl has that goal. And we'll see what the future brings. Yeah, it's funny that you bring that up. Because we were just talking about that where we said, because I was laughing that, the A's are going to be taking on the Yankees, and unfortunately, I have Glaber Torres on my fantasy team that Cody has talked me into, and Glaber Torres is not even hitting his weight. And I'm like, you know what drives me nuts is that you can't move guys around in fantasy, but in real-life baseball, it's very rare you have guys play just one position. Right? You'll see maybe you're a left-handed infielder, so you're going to play first base, or you're a catcher, maybe third base, but a lot of third basemen during the year at some point will will – venture over to first base we don't really see how it used to be where you just play short you just play second you just play center you just play i mean versatility is a big part of our game so when you're working with guys like for daryl i want to tell any team that i can play a lot of different positions because that can get me a job in this league for a long long time how big is versatility and how much do you try and make sure guys are versatile when they're down there playing for you um, I'll answer your second question first, uh, all the time, you know, versatility has so much value in today's game and athleticism and in whether you're a righty or lefty and matchups and trying to put guys in the best positions depends on, on that versatility you have on that team. So we do it here all the time. Daryl, when he's here, he'll be playing shortstop. He'll be playing third, um, Max Muncy, who's another one of our young prospects is going to go from you know, playing shortstop to third base to second base and just just trying to make them complete and well-rounded baseball players, giving them that versatility for the, the major league club when they do go up or do go back up is something that's not only important for the Oakland Athletics and, and their future and their now, but it, it's just the way the game is where, like you said, I mean, I mean very few people, you pencil in the lineup to, to play shortstop every day for 162 days on a major league team. So, you know, that, that's something that's focused on here, get, giving guys different looks on the field and, and working at different positions. And, you know, you see it in the lineups that we're, we're putting out here every day in, in Las Vegas. You know, Max Muncy, just watching him grow as a young man, because the first time we got to have him on this show is when he got drafted and he took BP at the ballpark and he looked like a high school kid. And then I ran into him during spring training. And I'm like, he doesn't look like a high school kid anymore. You've seen him grow up through this organization. What do you see now as a player in triple A? I mean, just such a phenomenal athlete and such a phenomenal kid that, that wants it, that works really hard, that has, you know, obviously lofty goals and lofty expectations on himself. Um, you know, Coming to AAA as a 21-year-old and being put in the starting lineup at a, a premium position is it's a big it's a big ask. It's a tall order, and he he's up to it. You know he's gonna he's gonna have his growing pains. He's he's gonna have to learn some things and make adjustments that he's he hasn't had to make so far in his career. But he's he's showed the ability to be a quick learner, and you know just being aware of the adjustments is the first thing he has to learn and. We, we spoke about that yesterday and then executing the adjustments as pitchers try to get him out in different ways as, as he learns the game speed of the, the new level and 
not only that, but he's preparing to, to go to the next level as well. Um, he's just a lot of fun to be around. He's got great energy, uh, you know, great, great enthusiasm for life and the game. And, and he's a great teammate. So just to watch his progression over the, over the years since we drafted him and now have a chance to manage him for the first time, it's been a lot of fun. How long has AAA been doing the uh, five-game series? Well, it's a six-game series, and we started that in 2021 after COVID. Okay. So in that time that you've watched these series, I would say I think this is great for players because you're going to have to make a lot of adjustments because you're seeing the same dudes for six straight days, right? So these teams are going to adjust to you as you're playing well or maybe not playing well. You're going to – there's a big chess game, six games versus three games, which is the norm uh, that we were so used to. Do you like it from that standpoint that for six games you're seeing the same guys and that your players are learning to make a lot of adjustments in those six games? I love it. I think it's great for development. Um, you know, it, it's it's great for travel. <laughs> first yeah. and foremost. But the, like you mentioned, the development part, is huge because you, you face the team six times in a row uh, on both sides of the ball, your, your plan, your approach, how to pitch somebody, how to go in, you know, looking to attack a pitcher. Um, it could change from the first three games to the second three games based on what your eyes are telling you, based on, on what you're feeling in the, the batter's box, based on where guys are hitting the ball consistently, um, based on pitches that, that hitters can get to and, and can't get to. And maybe – Maybe the, the scouting report was a little bit skewed to where he is during that series because, you know, players change. They feel good. They feel bad. They get better. Um, sometimes they regress if they're working on things and trying to take it into competition. So that 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 is a kind of a chess game aspect of the six-game series. And, you know, I, I really have nothing bad to say about playing the, the same team six games in a row. Yeah, I mean, if, if they're wearing your ass out for three games, you better make an adjustment at the plate because you got three more games to go. You better figure this out. You know, yeah. it's funny you say that. We just played Salt Lake um, at home last series, and they, they beat us up pretty good the first three games. And I thought we did a fantastic job of making adjustments with, with both the pitching side and the hitting side. And we came back and won the final three games of that series. Um and that that was a, I think, a growth moment for our team. And there was a lot of individuals that I, I saw make adjustments in that three-game winning streak at the end of the series. That you know said that hey, they're thinking through things and they're getting better through experience and and through watching the games. And that was a lot of fun. You know, just looking at your roster, looking at guys that obviously, you know, we we talked about Matt. Max Muncy, we, we talked about Brett Harris in the pa in the fa in, in the past, Armenteros, uh, Logan Davidson is down there. Is there anybody out there that uh, right now that you could say in your line? Because I definitely want to get into Joey Estes, but is there anybody in the lineup right now you'd like to highlight going, this guy's out to a good start, and whenever somebody's out to a good start, we know David Force likes to take guys who are hot. If they're on the 40, man, and you're hot, you got a shot. <laughs> Did you just make that up? That was pretty good. <laughs> Actually, I just did. <laughs> you, you can good. use that, Fran. You can yeah. use that. I, I better before you copyright it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you, you look at Tyler Soderstrom. He's got five home runs and a few doubles. The batting average isn't where, where he wants it to be, but I think he's having more competitive at-bats consistently, and that's that's been good to see. Um, Daz Cameron, the ball comes off his bat really well. And he, he hit his first home run of the season last night. And, and I think he's starting to come around a little bit. Um, you know, Stephen Piscotty swinging the bat pretty well. He, he's got a <clears throat> home run and a, a few doubles and very, very small sample size. Um, you know, it, it's just, uh, uh guys are, are still at the point where they're trying to find consistency. They're trying to, you know, stack up that bats and see pitches and, and get to a point where they feel comfortable so that we can start doing a little bit more damage with the bats. Yeah, you're having to manage Steve, but Steven Piscotty's what, 35? And Max Muncy's 21? I mean, it's amazing the ranges <laughs> and, and difference in careers that uh, you'll have to manage. Uh, Joey Estes, love the kid. Think that this kid has 
He's got, I mean, a long way to go, but he's kind of got that big game feel to him. Like he could be at some point when he gets up here and he's got his mojo going, he could win you a lot of games. How's the start of his season? You know, it, it's been up and down. He had a rocky first first start, um, and he still competed and still, you know, made made some pitches and limited damage. But it wasn't what what he would have, you know, taken out of that that first start. His starts subsequent have been <clears throat> pretty good. Um, not last night, but the start before, he was battling through uh, flu like symptoms on a on a day game, and you know it was ninety degrees and. He couldn't keep anything down, and he went out and battled for for four innings, only giving up a couple runs, and just that that showed me everything I needed to know about Joey Estes. Just his toughness and his his uh, ability to overcome, and just being out there and giving all he had for the for the boys. When, uh, in my opinion, he was having a hard time standing up, especially when he would come into the dugout and just try to 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 rest and get off his feet for for a few minutes before he went back out there. And by the time he came out of that game, I mean, he had nothing left to give. And, um, you know, I, th- I think he was proud of that. Uh, I know the the team knew what he was going through and that kind of bumped him up a notch and, as far as their respect and their trust in what he's able to do. And then he went out last night. Again, he didn't have his best stuff for command, but he gave us six innings and allowed, you know, two runs and, and just – competed at a really high level, got out of a bases loaded jam with nobody out in the fifth, only allowing one run. Um, so I, yeah, I agree with you. I think he's got a really bright future and he just keeps on getting better and better and understanding who he is as a pitcher more and more. Let's end on this. Uh, we we've talked before about guys coming down who aren't happy and we know Ruiz was not happy. He did not want to go down. It is what it is. You have talked about in the past that you got to make sure he gets over it. Let's get back to work and let's get you back up to the big leagues. Talk about Ruiz coming down because he did the work and he's back up and it looks like mission accomplished when he came down to you. He, he was amazing. He was absolutely amazing. Sure. Sure. He wasn't happy. No, Nobody's happy to, to leave the big leagues. And if you are happy to leave the big leagues, then you're probably not a big leaguer. Um, he did everything that you could possibly do. And I got to give a lot of credit to our, one of our hitting coaches, Brian McCarn down here, good old Mac. He, he just worked with him every day and, and Ruiz bought in to what, what we were trying to do and what Mac eventually worked with him on every day. And, you know, SC went out and played hard, just like he always does. He did everything that, you know, the, the major league team wanted to see. He started to hit the ball harder he had some some damage down here. He had he had three or four homers in the very small time he was here, and what he did and the attitude and the mindset that he came down to AAA with is 100% what what got him back up to the big leagues. And you know it was it was so great to see him hit a home run in his first at bat since being called up. And then I mean he squared up three or four balls after that first home run, including another home run. So. Just, you know, it's, it's great when good things happen to good people. And when you know the work that he put in and the time that he put in and the attitude that he had doing it the whole time, it just it kind of gives you goosebumps. So really happy for Esty. Great stuff as always, Fran. We truly appreciate it. We'll check in with you a little bit later in the season. You be well. All right. Thanks, Tony. Great talking to you. The great Fran Reardon right here on A's Cast Live. Love that guy. Leader of men. Glad to hear that. SC went down and uh, figured out what he wanted to do. Well, and he's right. He has squared up some balls. I mean, besides the two home runs, he's he's made some hard contact, which is what they wanted them to do. Well, I, you know, hey, Fran's right. If you go down to the minor leagues and you're happy, you're in the wrong business. Yeah, absolutely. You should be. You should be a little te- a little hacked off, as they say. Was it you that said it the other day? But that every time Ruiz, someone said it. I can't remember. But every time Ruiz puts the ball in the air, you think of Willie Mays. Hayes. That was me. <laughs> you may run like Mays, but you hit. Yeah, it's like I'm telling you. There's certain things, and for like my job, that I have to make sure that I stay on point. Like we're all gonna be excited, and like Ruiz goes deep, and everybody's like, "Yeah, great!" And then it's like, uh huh. Remember Rajay Davis? Who we love Rajay. We still bring him on the show as he works for Major League Baseball now. 
Speed guys hitting the ball in the air is not a recipe for success. Yes, hit the ball hard. You hit the ball hard, ball will go out, right? The ball will go out. But you start hitting the ball in the air a lot, your wheels will be nullified. So I caution everybody. I dig me some Ruiz hitting the ball of the ballpark too, but I need to see that ball going into gaps. I need that I need that ball on the ground going in between holes and beating balls out. I know David Force said on this show, well, hitting the ball on the ground with them and the speed, that didn't really I don't buy that. I think they were selling stuff to make them not look as bad as just sending them down. Uh, I do not want to see balls going in the air with Ruiz. Now, if he's if he's if you make good contact and what they try to explain to us, not being up here, as you saw, their their thing was he gets too much like this, which will lead to pop ups. They want to be in more down. Remember A Rod on Sunday Night Baseball talking about being mm-hmm. down. You know, squaring it up, bringing the barrel. You do that enough, there will be some balls that go out. Because anybody who says when they're in a good streak hitting home runs, they're, they're not trying to hit home runs. But all of a sudden, you start getting underneath it a little bit. You start hitting the bottom part of the ball. Boop, thank you. I If I'm a pitcher and Ruiz is hitting pop-ups, I'm like, thank you. How many pitchers would say you're going to face Ruiz tonight and he's going to hit the ball in the air four times? And I'm not talking about line drives. I'm talking about hitting the ball in the air. He's going to hit. He's going to have four at bats. He's going to hit the ball in the air for all four times. Would you take that as a pitcher facing Ruiz? Yes. All day, in Oakland, all day long. What the so what? enjoy these home runs. I'm just saying. I love it when Ruiz is hitting the ball, line drives, utilizing. Because he gets on base, and he's just, he's amazing. He's not a perfect player. And I get it, but I I don't like the different rules for Ruiz and everybody else. I don't like it. I don't like that he's not, you know, I don't like that they're going to say, and, you know, Kotze, we we did Mark early this morning, didn't know. If if I knew he wasn't going to be in the lineup today, it would have been like, you said he was going to come up and play every day. We didn't know. I thought he'd be in the lineup today. He's not in the lineup today. Yeah, Tristan McKenzie on the model righty. So we're playing a splits game. Yeah. Rook, Rooker's back. He's not in the lineup today either. And he's a righty. But yeah. The SC... it, you, know, you, you know what? Whether it's the A's or anybody else, if they just had transparency, it'd make everything so much easier. I don't know when I mentioned this. We had yesterday. It might have been Wednesday or whatever. Because there's been stuff with pitching, and I've been investigating, and the pitching people don't like you investigating. Let's face it. We don't have transparency in our game. We just don't. Go back to the PED. I lived through the PED era, just to let everybody know. I was on the air. I was the first guy in the Bay Area to announce Balco was being raided. I was doing the morning show. It came across the ticker. No one knew what the hell it was. I was doing the morning show with Gary Radnich on KMBR, and I read it right off the ticker. If it, if I wasn't the first, I'm second or third. Because we were the only sports station, and I don't think, because there was a tie to sports, ATF was raiding Balco. I'm not, it was KCBS News or KGO like jumping on that right away. I was like, you don't think Stan Bunger was reporting that? I'm thinking I was the <laughs> first guy in the Bay Area, which that means I was probably, there was a chance I was the first guy in the country to, to first say, this Balco place in San Mateo is getting raided. Did Was there a lot of transparency with that? No. No. Baseball is really, really bad at transparency. I think football nowadays Football used to not be. You didn't know what they were pumping into these guys. You didn't know what the pills they were taking. You didn't know the injections. Now, football's different. Everything's being recorded what's going into these guys' bodies. Right? There may be, but for the most part, there's a lot of transparency in what happens in football. Right? I mean, they they do a deal, right? They do a deal with iPads, right? Microsoft. Everybody yeah. has the same. The tab, Microsoft tablet or whatever it is. Everybody in the NFL has to have the same. That's what's brilliant about the NFL business model to where baseball's different. 
everybody's still trying to cloak and dagger and find, well, we're, we were hiring this firm to do this type of data for us. And we got independent contract. Like, you know, Sarah's is talking about the Dodgers got a bunch of independent contractors, guys. You don't even know who they are. And you just work on sliders and you just work on curveballs, and you just work on like, like everybody's got their secret sauce. That's the problem. Football, everybody's got the same stuff. Everybody has to use the same technology. You can only have X amount of coaches. You, I mean, you're not hiring outside firms. I mean, dude, it's it's regulated. Baseball is still cloak and dagger. So when you start investigating stuff, they don't like it. When, yeah, you talked about transparency. The first thing I think about now with my era of being in, in the media game is this thing. How many years are we talking about this? And we still don't know what is in this. <laughs> what are we, what are we... <laughs> Which one are we using? Exactly. Now, why are the seams different? Why is the weight different? Why is that? Well, every ball is different. Well, I get it because you see, you can go Instagram, whatever. They'll, they'll show you how they make the baseball. There's a whole process in the strings. There's different strings around the little core ball. To seeing all that, and they individual. There's a human being that actually stitches everyone. But yeah, there's no transparency. There's no transparency in the bats. There's no because the bats. I mean, you have all these. That's Scott Emerson's big deal is. Look how bats don't break. And when they do, it's like a projectile going through. It's just not this yeah. crack. It's like a projectile because they're so hard. There's no transparency. There's a, like, just tell us, listen, this is how we're going to play. Because that's the thing about football or basketball. You watch it and you understand. We're going to shoot threes. The coach doesn't have to tell you after the game to the media, our game plan is to shoot threes. Because I watched you just shoot threes. That's your game. When the Houston Rockets were basically saying, we're not shooting twos, we're shooting threes, they were the first ones to really do it. And you knew they're shooting threes all game long. That was one of my favorite things ever. I remember I booked Daryl Morey when I did mornings. And Morey came on and someone asked the question, like, Daryl, you know, why are you shooting more threes than twos? Well, last time I checked, the threes worth more than a two. So there's your answer. It's a game of math. <laughs> I mean, that's where I got it. <laughs> Working with Rick Buecher and doing the Warriors. That's where I got it. It's a game of math. I hit more threes. If I hit X amount of threes, and no matter how many twos you hit, you can't catch me. It's a game of math. And I was like, you know, I'm not the brightest guy in the world. I'm a public school kid. But I can figure that out, right? If I hit X amount of threes and you hit X amount of twos, you can't catch me. And then I start putting all this pressure on you because you're always down. You're always gripping it going, I make a two, they make a three. I make two twos, but they make a three. And you keep doing that throughout the game. You're like, and then I started watching it with the Warriors going, none of these teams can keep up with the Warriors because they just keep hitting threes and you're not hitting threes. So they're just adding to the scoreboard and you just can't catch them, right? It's like playing golf with Tiger Woods in his prime. He just keeps birdie and eagle. And I, what? I can't do that. So, um, transparency just come out and say it if you're right-handed you're not always going to play against right-handed pitchers i don't really know i never looked at his splits just say it i mean mark canna was one of the greatest examples mark canna saw so much time again before he became an everyday player they didn't like playing him against righties even though he was reverse splits he hit righties better can't go against righty lefty right i mean it's just just come out and say it, then we don't have to have these conversations. Uh, SD last year hit 245 versus righties, 274 versus lefties. So it's not that big of a difference, whereas he was hitting like 214 and 370. So instead of telling everybody two Fridays ago, was it two Fridays ago? Or was it no, last Friday? It was last Friday. Instead of last Friday telling us that, well, we're sending SD down, he's got to work on the old chicken wing. And, you know, when SD comes back, we want to be an everyday guy. Okay, he's back. Is he an everyday guy? Uh, he's started the one game against Steven Matz as a lefty. So why not just say he's going to be in a role? We want him to come back and be in a role, and he'll probably, you know, he's going to split time. You may not like the answer, but at least we know the answer. Right? Yeah. And I was just looking. I know it's a very small sample size, but so far this year, SC against righties hitting 
333 against lefties, 375. Now it's only been a total of 14 at bats combined between both, but still that's that's progress that you want to see from a young player like him. Yeah, and it goes to the injuries too, right? Like we can talk about our lineup. There's not transparency really with why our li- how we do our lineup. So there's always questions, and they could clear that up. And then now there's not a whole lot of transparency with with the throwing programs. So now you have all these pitchers getting hurt, and there's a lot of questions. There's not a whole lot of answers because they don't want to have transparency. Like every pitcher you talk to that gets hurt will tell you the plyo balls are a big part of it. You're throwing heavier to lighter balls, whatever. We see it because we're there early. We see them all using it. But you want to bring on a pitching coach to go through the whole throw program when he's had a couple guys go down with the bad UCL? Guess what? He doesn't want to do it. So there's not a whole lot. Baseball, for some reason, still is a cloak and dagger game. We still have we still have teams that have outside firms who do all their do all their data for them, right? They're providing them all this data. They're not going to tell you who it is. And it's a, still a cloak and dagger game. I wish there was more transparency. It'd make it easier. But that's why we have Tom Hamilton on. I mean, that's why you have one of the greats on, because you get all the answers that you need from a man <laughs> who's on the Trick Award list. How are you, my friend? I'm great, Chris. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? Uh, we're doing well, because things are a lot better since we last saw you. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, we were talking about it um, yesterday in Boston. I mean, you know, when we left Oakland, you were like, oh, oh. And, you know, then there was a game after hours in which the club had five airs. And yeah. I think you were one and seven and, and you're seven and four since that point. And, you know, that that's, a, again, a credit to Mark Kotze. I, I just think I'm a big fan of Mark Kotze. I know how much Tito uh, thought of Mark Kotze. Uh, because he had him as a player when he was a coach. And um, Tito thinks he's a tremendous manager. I know Stephen Vogt feels the same way about Mark. And that's been proven uh, because this, this is a different Oakland ball club that we saw, what, Chris, three weeks ago? Yeah, and I think something that you could use for your broadcast is, and, and since you guys were there and you know that everything was happening outside the ballpark, and oh, yeah. there was just a lot of bad mojo. There was a lot mm-hmm. of bad vibes. Once the team got out of Oakland, two out of three in Detroit, two out of three in Texas, then they come back home. It's just that all kind of went away. But so since that, since that tough, really just there wasn't a whole lot of good because there was great feelings in spring training, great feelings now. It's just that opening homestand, but uh, they got past that, so that's good. Uh, for you guys, wow, Stephen Vogt, <laughs> as you know how much we all love him. Couldn't yeah. be a better start. Another good series in Boston. You come back home. I just, what's the vibe like in Cleveland? Well, you know, as far as the city, um, you know, everyone's kind of right now locked into the Cavaliers. You know, they start their playoff run on Sunday. And, you know, it's that time of year in April. Um, and you folks went through it for so many years with the Golden State Warriors and uh, when they were winning those titles. Now, this is probably not a Cavaliers club that can win an NBA title, certainly the way Boston and some other teams look. But people are excited here. You know, the one thing about the NBA season, I'll give them credit. I don't know how in the world they sell tickets uh, because you go to a game and you have no idea if you're ever going to see the guy you wanted to see who comes to your town once a year. But they still pack the arenas. And, um, you know, we have, I think, what, 52 teams that were in the play-in game to get into the playoffs. So, uh, this is the fun time of the year for the NBA with the playoffs. So I think people here are, are really fired up for the Cavs. They, they had such a short run a year ago, and this is a really important playoff run for them, or there could be some traumatic changes uh, within that organization or on that team. As far as the baseball club, Chris, you know, I think people are excited. Um, it's hard to tell we've been gone. It seems like for the whole season, we started on the road. We're gone 11 days, played 10 games. We're home for a week. Now we just uh, came from Boston and got back last night. So I haven't really had a chance to even talk to many people in the area. You know, I, I think folks here have gotten kind of spoiled with 11 years of Tito because for 11 years he had relevant baseball. I, the one stat, Chris, that I have talked about to other people or other broadcasters like yourself that I think is the most remarkable stat of Tito's 11-year run here in Cleveland 
11 years. We know the playoffs, the World Series, all of that. Almost uh, that 11-year run um, constitutes almost 1,700 games. Only 25 times in 11 years did Cleveland play a game in which they were mathematically eliminated. Wow. That, that to me, is stunning. That's Jeter-like. And, yeah. You know, and and they've got the third best winning percentage behind the Yankees and Dodgers in that 11-year period. So I guess my point is, and it's long-winded, folks here have been spoiled. Now, I think Stephen and his coaching staff have done an incredible job because that's a tough act to follow when you're following, uh, following a Hall of Fame manager as popular as Tito. But, man, they knocked it out of the park when they hired Stephen Vogt. Is is there much of a difference? Like 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 what 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 is it like? Clubhouse running the team. He's learning on the job. Is yeah. it a lot different? Not much. What have you mm-hmm. seen? You know what? And again, you guys know Stephen better than I do, and I'm still learning him every day and and whatnot. But the thing that strikes you about him is how modest he is. You know, and very seldom. And I do the manager show every day. I can't tell you how many times he said in the manager show, you know, I don't know. This is the first time I'm doing it. How many times do people who may not know the answer, they're going to try to bluff their way through it and <laughs> make it sound like they know more than what they do? I, I think that's a, um, that's a great trait to have when you say, I don't have all the answers. You know, we'll we'll work on this together. I think the other thing is that Stephen has been so respectful of the job that Tito has done and did here and that the two of them have communicated several times. And he said to me the other day in the office in Boston, you know what? I feel like a guy that inherited a great mansion and it's a great place to live. Yeah, I'm doing a few things. I'm, I'm changing the paint color in some of the rooms and uh, we're doing a few other things here and there. But it was, you know, again, a tip of the cap to the fact that this is a good situation. It's been a winning situation now for 11 plus years. And a lot of that had to do with Tito, but also a lot of it with the guys in the front office like Chris Antonetti and Mike Chernoff and others. And again, Stephen votes humility for people like myself who really didn't know him as a player other than to talk to him briefly. Um, It's pretty astounding. And I think that really wears well in a clubhouse And the fact that it was only two years ago he was playing and the fact that he went through everything you could go through as a player, not getting to the majors until you're 27, being released, being demoted, being a two-time all-star, he can relate to every player on that team no matter what their role is. Well, I'm just looking at the notes, and Jimenez wore us out in those first four games. I'm like, you talk about getting off to a great start. And then I'm watching Quick Pitch every night, listening to your highlights, and I re- he's hitting 500 with runners in scoring position. So he hasn't stopped since he started oh. here in Oakland. He's off to an amazing start. Well, he is, Chris. And, you know, two years ago, he was arguably as good an all-around second baseman as there was in the game. He still was the gold glove winner a year ago at second, but he didn't have the same kind of offensive year. And quite honestly... This is still a ball club that's not loaded offensively. So your stars have to play like stars. They have to get that from Andre Simenez, from a Stephen Kwan, from Josh Naylor, from Jose Ramirez. But Jimenez is critical to this ball club being a better team offensively than they were a year ago. And to your point, um, man, when you get off to a great start, especially hitting in the clutch, man, that can have a carryover effect for a long time. Uh, do, do you give permission? Commander Cody, my great producer here, loves to say hosey. And I'm like, only Tom <laughs> Hamilton can say hosey. Do you give him permission to you? Because basically, the Tim Anderson, that was one of the great calls of all oh, time. Okay. With Ho- Do you give him permission to use hosey? Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah. What am okay. I going to do if, if I don't give him permission anyway? <laughs> I'll stop it. I'll stop it right now. Because we <laughs> say hosey. No. I say that's Tom Hamilton right there. No, he's, uh, Hosey doesn't care at that. You know what, guys? I, again, um, I've been here 35 years and been one blessed to have this job. But secondly, 
to see the great players we have had here since I started in 1990 and, and Hall of Famers and guys that probably should be in the Hall of Fame, but maybe for one reason or another won't get there. This guy, Jose Ramirez, is as good a superstar as we have had. When you consider everything that he has to deal with, you know, those teams, as great as they were in the 90s, boy, you had so many guys protecting each other in that lineup. I mean, one through nine, there wasn't a weak spot. You know, there have been a number of years here where Jose Ramirez isn't getting anything to swing at because he had no protection behind him. He's got that protection now in Josh Naylor. But the other thing is he's he's such a good third baseman. And you brought up the Tim Anderson point from a year ago. What that was all about, Chris, was Jose Ramirez sticking up for the rookies. There had been a couple of rookies, Gabriel Arias and uh, Brian Rocchio, that Tim Anderson, for whatever reason, was kind of trying to bully verbally uh, during the series in Chicago. And it continued the next week here in Cleveland. And Jose had said to Anderson, knock it off. Knock it off or we're going to have a problem. Well, Tim Anderson didn't knock it off. And so Jose knocked his block off. And um, that was all about protecting the young players. I mean, when a superstar is protecting your rookies, then you've got the best leader you can have in your clubhouse. We played it. Oh, your call, your call. We played it over and over. It was so good. It was so good. Thank you. It was fantastic. You know, going back to those, you know, reminisce about those Indians teams, they were just so loaded <laughs> playing in multiple world series. It's, it, it's so hard to believe that they didn't win a world series, but we're still going to remember their greatness. And the Great. fact that you had the sellout streak, Jacobs yep. field, you know, John Hart, Dan O'Dowd, they built it the right way going into the new yard. It's still to this day kind of the blueprint of how you want to do it. When you look back at that era, as you mentioned, Hall of Famers, great players, just what was what was Cleveland like at the time? And just to, to go through that as a broadcaster, you're part of that family. You know what, Chris? It was really a renaissance for the city. Um, economically, it was a much better time here in Cleveland. There were many more Fortune 500 companies. Um, the downtown, which is making a comeback again after COVID, um, the downtown was was really bustling then. And again, it was because of the business community in downtown Cleveland. You know, then secondly, you built a ballpark that at that time, um, the only ballpark that was comparable to Jacobs Field was Camden Yards in Baltimore. Camden Yards started it all in 1992. And then this ballpark opened in 1994. So you got out of the worst facility in baseball to as good a facility outside of Camden Yards as there was. You were literally going to a ballpark for the first time, not a stadium. And then Cleveland became the bully that was kicking sand in the other guy's face instead of vice versa. And what that team did, I think it, it was like the perfect storm. You had a vibrant business community. You had a brand new ballpark, the, the likes of something nobody could even envision in Cleveland. And you had arguably the most entertaining team that any of us will ever see again, the way they played the game, the way they carried themselves, and the way they dominated teams. Games were sometimes over before they started. And then what that did with all those playoffs, with the World Series, with the nation now getting a look at Cleveland in a different light, it ended the late night jokes, whether it was the Johnny Carson show or then David Letterman or whomever that ended everything as far as Cleveland always being the butt of a joke. And I credit the city, the ballpark, and obviously that ball club for turning the perception around about the city. Is it disappointing that they didn't win it? Yeah. Um, you know, I just think they were always maybe one dominant starter away from winning it all. We had good pitching. Charlie Nagy was really good. Oh, yeah. But you had Oral Hershiser and Dennis Martinez near the end of their careers. And you had good pitching and and had good bullpens, but you know, you got to get lucky in October. And then we also ran into that Yankee buzzsaw where and Joe Torrey would uh, tell me during the season, he knew a lot of years it was going to be us or New York going to the World Series. He always liked his chances because he thought he had better pitching. 
And in the end, in October, that's what wins. But, you know, I compared sometimes, you know, at least Oakland won it once. But those Bash Brother teams uh, that I started my career with and the Oakland A's going to the World Series three straight times and every year it looked like they were going to win 100, 110 games, you know, you thought maybe they would win more. Um, the teams with Mulder, Hudson, and Zito never got there. I think it shows you how good your teams can be, but then again, how difficult October is, and sometimes you just have to catch a break in October. And, uh, you know, hey, I, I, I think if you asked anybody here, the fact they didn't win it, Chris, the 90s is still their favorite era ever of Cleveland baseball. And I know all the old Indian players are really proud. I remember Ray Fossey and I went out yep. to Heritage Park and we did that interview where he got emotional. I got emotional. It meant so much to Ray to have that plaque. I then later mm -hmm. told Lynn K uh, Dwayne Kuyper uh, about the interview because Dwayne's plaque is right next to Ray's. And I know all the old Indian players. That new ballpark, they know at some point they were a part of it and being yep. out there at Heritage Park and having their plaques there, that means a lot to them. Let's end on this, so I want to end on Big Ten. So I think, <laughs> I think of you and the Big Ten Network all those years, did you ever envision a Big Ten Saturday morning matchup of Maryland-UCLA? No. Rutgers, no. Rutgers-USC. Well, that one I did. You know, I dreamed of that growing up in Wisconsin, that someday <laughs> Rutgers would finally play USC in a conference game. That one I, I did oh. dream about, Chris. But you know what? I um, I did the Big Ten for 25 years, uh, basketball, and I also early in my career was doing University of Wisconsin football and was part of Ohio State football. Um, I, I just uh, – and, and now I sound like, you know, the grumpy old man on his porch – I just hate what we've done to the college game. I, I don't understand why we're making all these changes just to satisfy football. That's what this is about. And um, the greed and the money involved to me is so disgusting. If, if football needs all of this, then take your 50 best football teams. Do whatever you want. Just, just have your own 50-team league. Do whatever you want. But can we leave the rest of college the way it was meant to be? with the Pac-10 or the Pac-12, uh, the Big 8, now the Big 12. You know, why are we ruining all of these great rivalries, all of the things that made college special? Chris, I was talking to somebody from the Ohio State program. I, I gave up doing the Big 10 a few years ago, but you're still, you know all the coaches yet, and you still talk to them. The Ohio State folks were telling me, you – want to bring a kid on campus for a visit. Now I had two boys that played D one baseball and played in the minors. I know how big a deal it was for them and us as parents. They want to bring you onto campus. They want you to go to a football game. They want to have you, you know, spend the night, blah, blah, blah. That, that was a big deal. No, nah, not anymore. These kids, some of them said, I'll come to Ohio state for a visit, but I need $10,000 for the visit. So, what happened to the days of you go to college to get an education to someday maybe hopefully make a lot of money? Now everybody wants to go to college and be financially independent before they've ever gone to a class. When's the last time anybody was ruled academically ineligible? I don't think that even exists. And now my home state of Wisconsin, they're voting on something Wednesday of next week about bringing NIL into the high school ranks in the state of Wisconsin. and High school kids? And I have a brother that's been a longtime baseball coach. He said there are 31 states in this country with NIL for high school kids. Wow. What? I mean, the greed is preposterous, isn't it? Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, my kids are going to be going to Cal, my twins. And just thinking about, think about. At least that's a cheap school. Yeah. So, so you got USC, UCLA going into the big Ten. Cal and Stanford are going to the ACC, the Atlantic coast conference. I can't wait Saturday morning, get ready and get up early. Cause when you can watch wake forest, Cal, that yeah. says college football. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a shame, Chris. And, and think of the non-revenue sports again, 
with my boys having played baseball, <laughs> it seemed like one of the prerequisites for any D1 program, if you're a non-revenue sport, baseball, volleyball, though some of the volleyball programs make money, but you know what I mean, swimming, tennis, track and field. Uh, guys, you also have to bring up the grade point average for everybody else on the basketball and football teams. So not only are we expected to win, we're expected to have good grades here with these non-revenue sports. How are you supposed to get good grades if you're the tennis team flying cross country? And how many times, you know, will a Cal have to do that? You know, it, it it's ludicrous. Well, I always appreciate your time. You know, talk about Stephen Vogt being humble. You're very humble. You're one. Oh, of the thank best. you, Chris. Thank you're, you. One of, you're one of the best that's ever done this. There, there, well, you're no very question. kind. Thank you. And at some point, that Ford C for we talk about this with Ken Korak. At some point, that Ford C for is going to happen. So let me just tell you, it's an honor to always have you on the program. It's sad this is the last time we're going to play, but we'll want to check in with you later on during the year. But uh, continued too, success there. It looks like a lot of fun in Cleveland. Always great to be with you, Chris. And go ahead, use Hosey. Yep, you have permission from <laughs> from the from the man himself. Thank you, Tom. I really appreciate it. <laughs> be well, my friend. Good luck. Thank you, guys. Take care. Bye bye. The great, the great Tom Hamilton, right here on A's Cast Live. God, he's great. He's the best. He's the best. Yeah, he has had an unbelievable career. Where's my guy Hosey hitting in the lineup today? I have not seen I, Cleveland's I, yeah, lineup. I'm sure he's hitting third. I mean, he's a he's a pretty solid player. That, that's he's going to be a Hall of Famer. Uh, yeah, we did this last time we played the Guardians. He is tracking. What, what time is our game? I feel what uh, pregame is at three thirty. So we got about an. Uh, what time's the start? Four ten. Four ten start. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. So this has popped up when I went on Twitter to try to find the Guardians lineup. Just heard from Brave Spencer Strider, who – this is Grant McCauley. I think he covers uh, the Braves. Uh, let's see. Yeah, uh, for a radio station in Atlanta. Just heard from Spencer Strider, who provided clarity on the issue in his elbow. A bone, a bone fag fragment formed in his UCL ultimately broke loose, causing weakness in his ligament. Fortunately, the ligament was fine and led to the UCL uh, bracing procedure. There was no need for Tommy John. So – if there was nothing wrong with the UCL, the UCL, why did they do the brace? It's a great question. I don't and know. I'm asking you, like you should know. Yeah, I know. I, but why do you? I, you do not know. You weren't there. Last time I checked, but I went to California University of Pennsylvania. I went there for uh, broadcasting. Not a, uh, I'm not a doctor. Fortunately, we only play one on. I let you play that on the show. I play draft expert on this show. So bone fragment formed. In the UCL, which sounds super painful. Because remember, the UCL, I will re remove part of the sleeve of my Link Soul sweater. <laughs> it's, it's, you feel your funny bone, right? Like go to the top, go to the right here. You know, when you hit your funny bone, you're like, God, you know, that's the UCL goes right through that groove right there, right? And right above your elbow, you can like move around. You feel it. It, you know, if you feel it, it makes everything all tingly, right? That's your UCL. So a bone fragment. Read that again. It it lodged in. Oh, hold on, I gotta find it again. Uh, a bone fragment formed in his UCL. A bone fragment formed in the UCL. So oh. maybe when you're taking the bone fragment out, because that's the thing, right? When we're dealing with a ligament or a tendon or whatever. There's different degree muscles. There's different degrees of tears. Okay. And so essentially what happens is, is if you have a tear in your UCL tendon and it's not a complete tear, there's just a, you know, there's some tear like Ken Waldachuk had some tear. It's not completely torn. That's where the bracket comes in, right? And you put the bracket in, and it allows it to heal faster and make it stronger, and you're good. Now, Eno Saris told us this, and I don't know if it was on air or off air, but he told us now what they are doing when you have regular time. So your, your thing's shot, right? It's either completely torn, partial, or really... 
there's there there's no helping it out. It needs Tommy John. That they're doing the Tommy John procedure as they normally do it. They normally take the ligament out of what is like your wrist or there's a couple part your wrist or your hamstring, and they're also doing the bracket with it. Yeah, didn't didn't Liam say his groin? They took some something out of his groin to use for his elbow. I swear that's what he told us. I don't remember. But yeah, that sounds. But yeah, they yeah, take it. I mean, yeah, they took a ligament from like his groin or something. So, so they're doing Tommy John surgery and they're doing the bracket also at the same time. Now they're 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 using the bracket with the Tommy John if they're doing the full blown. The bracket was for like Brock Purdy or Shohei Otani, where you don't have the full, you don't need the full reconstruction. And now sounds like. Spencer Strider, but they're saying the UCL is fine. Well, clearly, if it was just fine, then you wouldn't need the bracket. There had to be some type of tearing. Yeah, like, again, a bone fragment formed in his UCL ultimately broke loose, causing weakness in the ligament. Fortunately, the ligament was fine and led to... I don't think that reporting is all accurate because you because I would ask if the, if the ligament is fine, why would you do any kind of bracket? Yeah. If the they- ligament is fine. The ligament's fine. Like, there's no damage to the ligament. Why would you? And you open it up, and you just, you know, people have burns, bone spurs, floating chips. They have stuff like that. You just take that out and stitch it back up and stitch his heel on your elbows. Why would you do the bracket? Just to be safe? Because the bracket still requires, what, six to eight months. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned the thing about the Eno Saris. Um, one of our interns, Patrick, actually cut up that part of the interview for us. It's like... It was like two minutes, two a little over two minutes long between you and Eno. But yeah, it was definitely on air when when you guys were talking about that the other day. What was that? Uh, Tuesday, we had Eno Saris on. You want? Can you play that right now? Do you uh, have that? Yeah, give me a second. Let me just get it and we'll put it in here. And get That's ready actually to go. something I would really want to ask somebody because that reporting is. I, I you want to be real accurate with that. If you're like, hey, the 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 ligament's fine, then if the ligament's fine, why'd you put the bracket in? makes no sense so yeah let me so i have it here so let's uh, not trying to play doctor on the air that's dangerous but it's true it's like okay if you're reporting no damage there's no damage to the ligament you just remove the the bone spur that was in growing into or what however it was into the ligament you pulled it out and there's no damage stitch it back up let it heal He'd be able to pitch by summer. Yeah, Stitches sounds, heal. Yeah. They thinks heal. I mean, obviously, you've taken a a, um, a bone spur. At, it was a bone spur, right? Um, but it was what was the exact terminology? Yeah, it was the term. Was it a bone spur? A bone fragment. A bone fragment. So a fragment of of your bone. You pull it out. Things fine. Stitch it up. Let the stitches heal. Let that area heal. Human body heals. How how's he done for the year pitching? If there was no tearing at all, no that says no damage, right? Read that again. No damage. Um yeah, ultimately bone uh ultimately broke loose, causing weakness in the ligament. Fortunately, the ligament was fine and led to the UCL bracing procedure. Ligament's fine. Why do you need the bracing pr- Are you doing it as a precaution? Or are you just doing this like, ah, since we're in here anyway, might as well do it? Let me see if he, if this reporter Let's put anything else out there. Um, no, that's all he put up there about the whole thing. Does that sound crazy? What I'm saying? No, it makes sense. But yeah, you would think that he would be he would ultimately be back in the summer if he didn't have a tear or anything like that, right? I mean, we are seeing it now. Like, not to go off, but like we're seeing it today. The guy pitching for the Guardians, Tristan McKenzie, now is having an issue with his arm and he's like now second guessing that he maybe should have had Tommy John because his velocity's that down. That goes back to the Garrett Cole. We said this, I think last week where we said, listen, Garrett Cole by him still doing the, and I'll go back to the, how I started this show and what I've been thinking about. Cause I've been doing a lot of, I, I've been trying to dig into the, the cloak and dagger of baseball and what's going on pitching just to let you know, behind the scenes, I'm doing my due diligence and I'm questioning. Not everybody loves it, (laughs) Uh, but I'm doing my due diligence to educate myself, find out exactly what you're doing. And then I can kind of 
piece it together here for everybody that watches the show because we like to be at the forefront of things. And I got to tell you, I think Garrett Cole, once again, he's trying to do, he has increased everything unnaturally. Garrett Cole always threw card. This is who he is. He increased everything. Now he's hurt. So you've hurt yourself. You're hoping rest in these PRP rich platelet, rich, whatever the hell it's called. The PRP injections and what they're going to do is going to make you better, but you're going to go back to throwing beyond what you naturally are able to do. That's what McKenzie's going through. And so what's going to happen is because you've hurt yourself, and you've tried to do everything you can to not have surgery. Same thing happened with Shane Bieber. Remember, Bieber was talking about that, and the velocity was down, and he and he had one of those injections and did one of that, and then went to driveline and got it back, and now he's got to have it. It's like, if you're not able to go 100%, and you end up having to have it, you cost yourself two years. Like, if he would have had it, got hurt, and be like, bro, take care of it this year, he'd be back next year. But if something happens midsummer, he comes back and it's still done and he has to have it, you're talking about Garrett Cole, a nine year deal. You're taking two years of that deal right out of the gate. He's now not pitching. Yeah. And I was just reading to see when Cole might be back. And it says apparently he started his throwing program, but he's nowhere near. Uh, close to rejoining the rotation. They were saying he would start throwing and like maybe he'd be back by May, something mid to late May, early June. But that's why I asked you buying or selling the other day. Buying or selling Garrett Cole will pitch again this year, and you said he wouldn't be back. And I, I'm starting to think that he might not be back for the. Game. And then he won't be back for next year because he's going to have to have the surgery. And the surgery they want you 14 to 16 months. So they would do a Tommy John with the with the bracket and do all that, and it's going to be. And all of a sudden. You're in your 30s, bro. Yeah, How many years you got left? You just took two years of your career. Now, the simpleton will be like, look at the money he's getting paid. Do you think Garrett Cole at this point needs any more money in his life? And plus, that money's guaranteed anyway. He wants years. He wants to play. I, I, I said it to you perfectly. He's 33. He'll be 34 in September. So you're basically taking the last years of your prime gone. He's our last. He could be our last chance for a guy to win 200 games. <laughs> But you're taking two years off of his career. Yeah. Now, that could, ex you know, and then I love when the simpleton will say, well, that will extend his career. And now he's getting into his late 30s, early 40s. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard on everything, right? Because what you also learn is the the evolution of people, of lives. It is, it's one thing to be a young husband a young father in your career, a professional career like this, where you're traveling all that. And then all of a sudden things start to change. You start getting into your late thirties, into your forties. And now your kids are teenagers. And now you want to watch your kids play baseball and you want to watch your daughter, whatever your sons and daughters, whatever they're into. I just threw baseball in there because Mom was a softball player at uh, UCLA. Oh, yeah. Brandon yeah. Crawford's sister, who's married to Garrett Cole. They met at UCLA. So whether your daughters are playing sports or acting or whatever, or your sons are acting, doing whatever they're doing, sports, or whatever activities your kids are in, you, you want to be a part of their lives. You've been traveling around doing this thing for a long time. So whenever it's very simple, it's very sports radio. Oh, you know, this will just uh, prolong their career. Not every guy wants to play well into his 40s. Especially a guy who's made all the money in the world. There's other things that you want to do. There's other things you want to experience. I mean, I'm a far different person than I, when I was in my 30s. My wants, my needs, my goals have all changed dramatically. So we always just act like, oh, hey, get the surgery. Well, if Garrett Cole didn't get the surgery and has to get the surgery later, he's now knocked off two years of his career. Think about that. Two years of the back of your prime. Two years is a long time. 
that you lost in your career. I mean, and I don't care what surgery you have. You're now starting to experience it. As you get older, it gets harder. And you get into your 40s, you do not feel like you do you did in your 20s. Any anybody watching out there? Hello? Anybody in their 40s? You, you yeah. Try drinking all night long and see how it works for you in your 40s. Try working out a ton, see how it works for you. It's not like it was in your 20s. Your body just doesn't recoup. You're not science science will tell you you're not producing as much testosterone. Your body as a man stops producing a lot of testosterone to like zero. Right? Things change, right? It's funny you mentioned about working out. I was talking I was listening to Farron and Duquette this morning on Power Alley and they had Tori Lovello on. And Tori's up there, he's what 58, I want to say, I think. And they're asking about working out. He goes, you know, body's not the same. So him and like Mike Hazen and a couple other people are taking a boxing class when they're at home. And he's like, yeah, I do all that. And Farron's like, you know, how often does he say you get to punch your boss in the face? And like they went through the whole thing. And he goes, but we're on the road. They play. Ba- he plays basketball. He's like, I'm getting ready to go after this. I'm going to go play basketball for the game today. And I'm like, they hear a 58 year old manager talking about playing basketball and boxing. I'm like, you know, it's crazy to think. Like as I'm running on the treadmill, listening to them talk about this, I'm like, this guy's 25 years older than me, and he's talking about doing all these things. Good I'm like, for him because a lot of people aren't. By the way, basketball, the number one Achilles tendon tear sport when you get older. Uh, yeah, I could see that. Yeah. Just throwing it out there. All right, we're, do we have time for? Uh, so we have Stephen Kwan. We're gonna play, but let's play the Eno Saris real quick. Okay, this is apparently I, I haven't heard it, but it's apparently the back and forth with you guys. So let me. Okay. All right, so here we go. This is from Tuesday on our show, and we were talking about when we we're gonna do the Mark Kotze show when he's in Cleveland, and we talked about some things, and and I said to him, I said, man, it's pretty amazing looking down at the bullpen and watching Waldachuk throw today, and. We just kind of laughed and went, you know, the, the, this new bracket, you know, we, we the Brock Purdy surgery mm. that uh, we, we've learned from Dr. Meister. It's, you know, Tommy John, you would have not have seen Ken Waldachuk on a mound throwing like that. No, six months. He, he was bringing it. That bracket that they do and the way they've changed Tommy John surgery is, it's, yeah. I'm not going to say it's a miracle, but it is impressive. Well, there, the situation has to be a little bit right. It's called internal brace. And what it has to be is like not a full tear. And so every time you hear that someone has a sprained UCL, a sprain is a tear. And so it's just a question of how, how thorough the tear is and where the tear is on the elbow. And if you, if you are in a certain place on the elbow, you can do just an internal brace, which is basically almost like a little piece of like plastic or whatever that goes in there and like suitors the two parts of the, uh, of, of the tear together, almost like stitches for your, for a ligament, you know, yeah. and holds it in place uh, for six months. And then the recovery time is six to eight months. You know, on TJ, full TJ, they're actually taking uh, like a ligament. Usually here, they take a ligament out of your wrist or out of your hamstring. And they're taking uh, like other ligaments and putting them on and trying to like graft it together. And that that recovery timeline, it's better if you let, wait 16 months. Yeah. It's, you know, it's more it like used 14 to, the, to 16. Remember guys tried to come back quicker than a year. And then we realized bad news, 14 months you're at out, least. Yeah, yeah, you're back out again. So even now what they're doing is on the regular Tommy Johns, they're doing the brace too. So they're doing hybrid surgeries. That's if you have a full tear, they'll do the hybrid surgery because they're like, maybe this will, maybe this will help you go faster. But if you have a smaller tear, I think it must've been what Ken had either in a smaller tear or in a different part of his elbow, you can just do the brace and you can get back quicker. So Lucas even Giolito full on Tommy, so even full on Tommy Johns, they're how doing you get part the brace. Of that. Yeah, you get, the so brace we hopefully we don't see you again. There you go. Just put the brace in anyway. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Have we taken a break? No. Maybe we should do that. We're rolling. It's right. See what happens on a day off? I'm not used to having a day off. Were you, were you okay on the day off? Um, yeah. You know, I still had work to do. Not as much, but. You had a day off. I still, no, I sit in front of my computer for at least five hours a day and work work on things. Yeah, well, you have weekends off. Other of us don't have weekends off. Um, I still do some things on the weekends. Okay, loading a show does not count. I, I have to sit in front of my computer and not go anywhere. Oh god, people need post game down. Want to hear our post game? Yeah. Uh huh. When you're in San, how many how many trips you got this season? Uh, none so far. Well, besides the All Star break one, where we're all gonna be gone. <laughs> we're all no gone. San Luis Obispo. How many times did you go to San Luis Obispo last year? Um, way more than this year. I haven't we even gone. How many time. times did you go last year? Mm, four or five, probably. Oh, four or five must be nice. Yeah. 
Go down to slow you and Greg and slow. <laughs> I've still never met Greg. <laughs> you don't want to meet Greg. I met Greg. It's another. Thing. Uh, what are we? All right. Coming up next, Stephen Kwan. He's in the notes today. Why? He's hitting 354, the Bay Area kid. That's right. Stephen Kwan will join us next. It's something we did when he was here. We never got to play it for you. Correct. Yeah, right. So opening weekend. We did all opening this. weekend. We had so much going on. We never got to play for you. But Stephen Kwan will join us next. Where does one community end and the next begin? Across the railroad tracks? On the other side of the river? Is it between the east side and the west side? At Comerica Bank, we believe it's all one community, and we're all part of it. That's why Comerica has invested over $20 million for affordable housing, financial education, and workforce development in lower-income communities. Because when we raise expectations for everyone, we all rise. Member FDIC, Equal Opportunity Lender. Whether it's a midweek trip to the ballpark to catch a game or a weekend of baseball for the family, grab your tickets for an A's game this season. Secure your seats today for all the biggest matchups, fireworks, drone shows, giveaways, and more. Don't miss out on all the things happening this season. Rose and Seth. It's a drive into center. It's deep, and Straw is back at the track. He will turn and watch it fly. So grab yours now at athletics.com slash tickets. That's athletics.com slash tickets. Hey, Oakland A's fans, step up to the plate with Xfinity Internet. Get the fastest speeds and low lag streaming for an incredible viewing experience that knocks it out of the park. And you'll have a consistent connection with reduced buffering and freezing so you can stay in all the action inning after inning. When it's game time, make sure to catch it all with Internet that's powerful and reliable. Stream sports from the best seat in the house with Xfinity because it's only live once. Actual speeds vary, not guaranteed. Many factors affect speed. For factors affecting speed, visit Xfinity.com slash network management. This is the place where you can dance like nobody's watching, win like nobody's business, and get away like you mean it. So what are you waiting for? Come join the party, take that evening out, and make it a night you'll never forget. This kind of action can't be beat. This is Chris Townsend. I'm proud to announce our year two partnership with Link Soul. They've changed my wardrobe and they can do the same for you. And right now their spring collection is fabulous. Natural fabrics and versatile styles, perfect for this time of the year. And they want to introduce their performance line for golf, premium for on-course apparel design and to keep you cool and drive. Check it all out, linksoul.com. That's linksoul.com. Remember, look good, play good. With more sunshine returning, it's time to get outside and make the most of what Cinnabar Hills Golf Club has to offer. Like 27 championship caliber holes tucked in the beautiful hills of San Jose. And take advantage of their amazing Bay Area views for your next special event. It's all for you at Cinnabar Hills Golf Club, an award-winning venue designed to peacefully take you away from the bustle of Silicon Valley. Go to CinnabarHills.com. That's CinnabarHills.com. If you're looking for a new mattress, Nest Bedding has you covered. Sleep on the same mattress Hall of Famer Ricky Henderson sleeps on. Nest Bedding is the number one brand of online mattresses in the Bay Area's favorite mattress store. Take home the Easy Breather Pillow. The New York Times calls it their number one pick. You can navigate their easy news website, nestbedding.com. That's nestbedding.com. Green and Gold fans, use the coupon code Oakland and you get 10% off your entire order. Nest Bedding, love where you sleep. You deserve extra. Extra Mile is where you get it. You don't just deserve breakfast. You deserve extra fresh Mile One coffee just the way you like it. You deserve more than a quick bite. You deserve an extra satisfying array of hot foods, extra good snacks, and fountain drinks that help you go the extra mile. Plus, with Extra Mile rewards, you can earn free stuff. Visit Extra Mile at select Chevron and Texaco locations. See program terms and conditions for details. If you're looking for a great place to eat and watch games, go see our friends at the Chicken Pie Shop of Walnut Creek. The Chicken Pie Shop is one of the hottest restaurants in Walnut Creek. You're not going to find a better menu and come try their world famous chicken pie that has been served in Southern California for 86 years. Spacious indoor and outdoor dining perfect for your next private party or corporate event. Don't forget free parking. For more information, go to chickenpieshopwc.com. That's chickenpieshopwc.com. 
And the underdogs, Oakland Athletics, win their first championship since they were in Philadelphia in 1930. Hi, I'm Raleigh Fingers, Hall of Famer, three-time World Series champion with the Oakland A's and World Series MVP. Winning takes teamwork, skill, and heart. So when you need an ace for a personal injury lawyer that will win you the game, go with the winning team. Call Venardi Zarata at 833-VZ for me or go to vzlawfirm.com. Bernardi Serrata, the official injury law firm of the Oakland A's. Like sports, business is about winning. Championship decisions are business decisions based on what it takes to help your company win. And that's why there's UBO Business Services, specializing in helping you win every day by streamlining workflows, managing documents, and providing the best-in-class office technology. Make your championship decision with UBO Business Services. Visit them at ubeo.com. That's ubeo.com. Streaming from the studio, A's Cast Live continues with Chris Townsend. Mark Kotze coming up when? Uh, 15 minutes from now, 3 o'clock. All right. First pitch is what? 410. A's total access. 3.30. Let's go. Ready to rock. You ready to rock today? A's Guardians, Stephen Vogt, uh, Tristan McKenzie. Bring on the Vogt coats. Tristan McKenzie versus Joe Boyle. I got big Joe Boyle, who's got a 0.90 ERA in his last two starts after opening day against Boston. I got big Joe. What do they got? Uh, Tristan McKenzie, who's losing Velo and has... Five strikeouts on the year. Five. That's uh, that's not good. For Big that's... Joe Boyle. You think he's a day at the beach to face? You want to face that guy? Six, seven, blowing up. 99. See, Joe Boyle, he's a nat. That's natural velocity for him. That's why, you know, I mean, anybody can get hurt. But this is not Joe Boyle's having to manufacture unnaturally get to a point. This is natural for him. When you got that big frame and you're coming downhill, foof. I like watching Joe Boyle pitch. He doesn't need much. Fastball slider, let's go. What else does he need? And that's the whole thing I've talked about. When you, it's, you know, it's angles, right? He's six, seven on top of that mound. It's what Kyle Moeller talked about. Kyle Moeller got two east, west, not north, south coming down. When you're coming down the mountain, and that ball is just boring down on you as a hitter. The eye level, right? You know, so many times, I mean, if you've played baseball, everybody knows the ball up looks great. You can't hit it, but it looks great. Remember that when you, I don't care what level of baseball you played. You love swinging at high pitches. Why? Because it's closer to your eye level. It looks great. Your eyes go, S- yes. <laughs> now, if you can get on top of it, tomahawk it. All right. Go a little Josh Donaldson. But, yeah, that, that, that upper high fastball, it's tough to hit, man. It's tough to get on top of it. You hit underneath it. You miss it or you hit underneath it, pop it up. But your eyes love it. But that's the thing. Joe Boyle's just coming down at you. And it's, I mean, he's Chris Young. Chris Young was 6'10", general manager now of the Rangers. He was 6'10", Boyle 6'7", but Chris Young threw, you know, 88. Yeah, he wasn't. This is 98, 99 coming down at you 6'7", man. That's That's got to be. And he doesn't know where it's going sometimes. So he's like Randy Johnson. When Randy was young. Scott Emerson doesn't like when I say it. Effectively wild. <laughs> I got called effectively wild once. It's like you don't know where it's going. Sometimes you can play to your fa- I mean, what did what did Crash Davis say to Nuke, Nuke Lelouch? Hit the bull. What are you talking about? I got great control right now. Hit the bull. You want them thinking you don't. You want guys going up there with a little doubt. You know anybody was you anybody who thought would buzz your tower? Nolan Ryan would buzz your tower. Randy Johnson scared the hell out of you. Roger Clemens, you know, dot you in a second. You want that. The the fear factor, right? Joe Rogan's fear factor back in the day. Did you ever watch that? My yes. wife loved yeah. fear factor back in the day. Fear factor, right? You need that fear. Bob Gibson. 
Who is it? Willie Mays. I did an interview with Willie Mays a long time ago. He said Don Drysdale knocked him down every single time. And Don Drysdale was out there for all nine nine innings. So uh, Willie would face him like four or five times a game. Every single time. This Willie maybe exaggerate. I don't know. But I believed him that Don Drysdale, because Willie was the star, Willie got right up on the plate. Don Drysdale is a massive man. I'll just always remember when Don Sutton threw at Ray Fossey in an old-timers game. Like, everybody thinks, oh, it's the great Willie Mays. Oh, really? Don Drysdale was 6'5". Willie Mays is 5'10", maybe. Kind of like I'm 5'10". In the, oh, I was 5'11 in the program, right? <laughs> Willie Mays and I are pretty... You know, it's like Kyle Murray. When oh, Kyle Murray's six feet, what? I might eye with Willie Mays. Don Drysdale was six five. You think Don Drysdale was afraid of Willie Mays? He would throw right at Willie Mays and go, "What are you going to do about it?" That was old school baseball. The fear factor. Joe Boyle's got the. Joe Boyle's not out there scaring people because you're like, "Oh boy, man, this guy's going to dot me." Joe Boyle's scaring people because you know when Johnny and I were calling it spring training. He threw two fastballs over the umpire's head. Effectively wild. I'm in the booth. Like, I don't know, maybe just because I'm an ex-pitcher. I'm like, like, is no, no one noticing this? <laughs> and then he then he roped off like four straight sliders. Why did why would Joe Boyle go to like four straight sliders after that? Uh, because he couldn't find the strike zone of this fastball. He's got no idea yeah. where the fastball's uh, going, and it's 100 miles an hour. If that doesn't scare the hell out of you, I don't know what would. What will? There's a guy on a mound 60, six feet, 60 feet, six inches away, which actually that's not because after a six, seven body comes down, he releases it. He's like 50 feet away, and he's throwing it 100 miles an hour, and he doesn't know where it's going. You That doesn't scare you. That would scare the living daylight. You know how hard? If he'd hit you right in the back. You know, you'd be bruised for weeks. It would hurt so bad. It would hurt at night when you're sleeping. It hurts to get hit by one of these. It hurts. Joe Boyle in spring training threw two fastballs over the umpire's head. I was like, oh, my God. I mean, literally, you can kill somebody when you throw that hard and you don't know where it's going. Yeah, yeah. Use it to your advantage, my friend. Joe Boyle. Here's Stephen Kwan. Bay Area Zone Stephen Kwan. We had him on opening day. We didn't get to play it, but we want to throw it to you today. He's hitting 354 right now for our, for the Guardians. Here's Stephen Kwan. Back here on A's Cast Live, Stephen Kwan is with us, of course, with the Guardians, but we always will know him as a Bay Area kid who grew up in Fremont. It's always ha great to have you on the show. It's great to have you back home. How is everything going? It's good to be back. Yeah, I mean, sleep in my own bed, have my parents cook up a good meal. I mean, <laughs> it's always a pleasure coming back here. And, you know, it's funny, now that you've done this for a few years, you've got to learn the game of all the people that want tickets and learning to manage the process. What has that been like? Yeah, I mean, those first couple of years was was awesome. You know, wide-eyed, just enjoying the moment and everything. I think I had no idea how much that sapped energy for me. Last year was kind of that learning process. And then this year, setting those boundaries early, I think, has been really important. I mean, like I was telling you, yeah. opening day um, and being back home kind of coincide with the hecticness, but it's been it's been fun so far. It's been good. Well, it's so special because obviously you grew up coming to this ballpark as a kid and all the family. Actually, he got to meet some family he's never met before who showed up to the ballpark. But just talk about coming home, playing here, what that means to you. I think every time it's just so surreal, like I said, like coming to field trips, coming to games with my friends, my family. Um, sitting up in the nosebleeds, just being just being a menace up there. It's just crazy now being on this on this field. I remember thinking it was so big, and now I'm occupying the outfield out there. Um, perspective never changes. It's always so surreal coming back here every time. So two more hits last night. You have played well. This place suits you. You look at the numbers. Why do you like hitting here so much? I think it's just the comfort. It's got to be the comfort. Knowing my parents are here, my friends and family are here, it almost like kind of, detaches me from like the seriousness of the game i mean absolutely it's a job we want to do really well but i mean you know having your parents love and your friends kind of going for a copy before i think that kind of de-stresses everything and just allows you to play at your your most free and your most fun so let's look at this year with steven Vogt. i mean terry francona we'd love to have him on the show uh but now steven Vogt, you know how well we know steven Vogt. we know him real well what's it been like the transition from terry francona to steven Vogt, and what's voter like as a manager yeah it's definitely been uh, it's been different for sure 
Um, Tito kind of had that old school kind of style, kind of let people do their thing. Um, I was definitely a little skeptical when Vogue came in, just because it's all I've known. It's Tito, you know, Hall of Fame manager. I've had success with him. Let's see how Vogue is, but Vogue has been awesome. I mean, the level of feel that he has is unbelievable. Um, I've heard horror stories of new managers that just try to get their fingers in everything, and Vogue just kind of lets us do our thing. He trusts the, the coaching staff. He trusts us to do our job. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, in, even in spring training, we were doing sliding practice, and he got us to go out on a slip and slide, and yeah. he was hopping on there like – He's definitely got the energy of a, of a player still, but definitely a ton of feel, a ton of knowledge. Now, last year wasn't the year you guys wanted to have sending Tito out that way, but obviously being in this organization ever since coming out of Oregon State, you know how competitive this organization has been. What do you think about this season for the Guardians? Yeah, I think we just took this year a little more seriously. I think last year we were still really young. Um, we just thought we could go out on the field and just win every game like we did the year before. Um, I think that anxiousness and that drive just wasn't as prevalent as before. I think this year, a lot of people didn't have years that they wanted. We as a team didn't have the year that we wanted. It kind of made us take the offseason a little more seriously. Um, we got to spring training early. I mean, Jose was there a week before. We even had to be there. I think when you have your leader there before everybody else, it sets the precedent. So definitely taking this year a little more seriously. I think we're really optimistic with things, how things are going to go. Now, we, we were actually talking about it on the show this week going, you know, this guy's probably going to be a baseball Hall of Famer. In the end, he's going to be one of the great Indians slash guardians. You just look at the numbers, the consistency, how hard he plays every single day. What's it like playing with him? Yeah, I mean, I learned so much from him. I think I, have, I can attribute a lot of my success to him. Um, seeing a guy who's gotten paid, he's gotten whatever he needs taken care of. And he's still doing hard 90s on the line. He's doing early defensive work. Like, that just shows, like, you need to do the little things to be successful in this game. And he shows up every day. He never complains. Um, he's our fearless leader for a reason. He's definitely underrated. I think he, he's definitely one of the greats in this game. And you know, like, with Oakland, kind of the same thing in Cleveland. Whenever someone starts getting towards getting paid in free agency, like Shane Bieber we're now talking about could possibly be leaving. He's the one guy that said, I want to be here. I've committed. I, I'm a... I'm a guardian. What does that mean to you young guys? Yeah, it's huge. I mean, it's definitely sad. We've already seen some of our big guys go and get some some big contracts, which they obviously deserve. Um, but it's always hard to kind of see our guys go off. Um, you know, you form bonds with them over the year, but Jose's obviously made that commitment that he wants to stay, and I think that empowers everybody else. Like, Jimenez did the same thing. He wants to stay. I yeah. think that's going to create that culture that people want to stay. Hopefully, Cleveland recognizes that and start paying some of the guys. But, I mean, it definitely sets a precedent going forward. Well, obviously, we talk a lot about your offense. Some people forget you're a two-time Gold Glove winner now. Talk about your defense and how proud you are of that defense. Yeah, I mean, extremely proud. I think mean, my dad always told me defense never slumps. If you don't have a good hitting game, you always make an impact with defense. Um, I think that came kind of early on. I wasn't always the best hitter, so I had to kind of focus on defense and just doing the little things to, to impact the game. Um, definitely take immense pride in it. And it's, it's cool kind of seeing it evolve. Um, just trying to continue to get better. There's always lawyers to get better with every time, but yeah, definitely, definitely very prideful of that. No, those awards are it's the Rawlings Gold Glove. Ray Fossey, former Indian and A, would always tell us, remember, it's the R Rawlings Gold Glove. They're sweet. Where are they? I got one in my parents' house and I got one in my place in Chicago. So definitely, uh, <laughs> definitely got them locked down. They're heavy. I'm, I'm sure you felt a couple yeah. of them. My God, they are way heavier than beautiful. I Beautiful. Yeah. They're absolutely they're awesome. beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Well, we always appreciate the time. I wish we could see you more. We only get you one time a year. But obviously, being a Bay Area guy from Fremont, everybody's rooting for you. We're rooting for you. Thank you for yeah, the time. I appreciate the time as always. And yeah, then always uh, maybe we'll talk to you when the A's get to uh, Cleveland. If not, we'll see you next spring Absolutely. training. That sounds great. That sounds good to me. Appreciate you guys. Whether it's a midweek trip to the ballpark to catch a game or a weekend of baseball for the family, grab your tickets for an A's game this season. Secure your seats today for all the biggest matchups, fireworks, drone shows, giveaways, and more. Don't miss out on all the things happening this season. Rose and Seth. It's a drive into center. It's deep, and Straw is back at the track. He will turn and watch it fly. So grab yours now at athletics.com slash tickets. That's athletics.com slash tickets. Where does one community end and the next begin? Across the railroad tracks? On the other side of the river? Is it between the east side and the west side? At Comerica Bank, we believe it's all one community, and we're all part of it. That's why Comerica has invested over $20 million for affordable housing, financial education, and workforce development in lower-income communities. Because when we raise expectations for everyone, we all rise. Member FDIC, Equal Opportunity Lender. With an advanced network, cybersecurity solutions, and trusted partnership, Comcast Business powers more businesses than anyone. Comcast Business, powering possibilities.
Get started with internet and security for your small business for $49.99 a month for 12 months with a two-year contract. Plus, ask how to get up to an $800 prepaid card with qualifying internet. Call today. It's 5524. Restrictions apply. New customers only with 50 megabits per second internet and security edge. Eco bill and auto pay required. Equipment, taxes, and fees extra. This is the place where you can dance like nobody's watching. Win like nobody's business. And get away like you mean. So what are you waiting for? Come join the party. Take that evening out and make it a night you'll never forget. This kind of action can't be beat. This is Chris Towns, and there are two things that are a must for me, comfort and style. Whether I'm playing golf, going to dinner, I've got to have the right feel. That's why I've partnered with Link Soul, and you're going to love Link Soul. They have just released their new spring line, new fabrics for their polos, lightweight and perfect for technical performance. Link Soul also has new styles for their layers and hoodies with cool prints and seasonal colors. You know what they say in the big leagues, look good, play good. Go to LinkSoul.com. That's LinkSoul.com. You deserve extra. Extra Mile is where you get it. You don't just deserve breakfast. You deserve extra fresh Mile One coffee just the way you like it. You deserve more than a quick bite. You deserve an extra satisfying array of hot foods, extra good snacks, and fountain drinks that help you go the extra mile. Plus, with Extra Mile rewards, you can earn free stuff. Visit Extra Mile at select Chevron and Texaco locations. See program terms and conditions for details. With the sunshine returning, it's time for golf, golf, and more golf at Cinnabar Hills Golf Club. Cinnabar Hills is also your destination for great food with their beautiful renovated restaurant and quality craft beer selection at their full bar. Featuring a grass driving range and 27 championship caliber holes, Cinnabar Hills Golf Club is the best public course in the Bay Area. For more information, go to CinnabarHills.com. That's CinnabarHills.com. If you're looking for a new mattress, Nest Bedding has you covered. Sleep on the same mattress Hall of Famer Ricky Henderson sleeps on. Nest Bedding is the number one brand of online mattresses and the Bay Area's favorite mattress store. Take home the Easy Breather Pillow. The New York Times calls it their number one pick. You can navigate their easy-to-use website, nestbedding.com. That's nestbedding.com. Green and gold fans, use the coupon code OAKLAND, and you'll get 10% off your entire order. Nest Bedding, love where you sleep. If you're looking for a great place to eat and watch games, go see our friends at the Chicken Pie Shop of Walnut Creek. The Chicken Pie Shop is one of the hottest restaurants in Walnut Creek. You're not going to find a better menu and come try their world-famous chicken pie that has been served in Southern California for 86 years. Spacious indoor and outdoor dining, perfect for your next private party or corporate event. Don't forget free parking. For more information, go to chickenpieshopwc.com. That's chickenpieshopwc.com. If you're looking for the latest green and gold gear for the 2023 season, then look no further than athletics.com slash shop for your officially licensed gear. That's athletics.com slash shop. The A's YouTube page is your go-to destination for A's video content. Get access to great highlights, exclusive behind the scenes content, classic games, A's cast live, and more. Visit youtube.com slash athletics. You're listening to A's Cast Live. Here's Chris Townsend. Verlander back tonight. The against, quest for 300. Against the Nats, who apparently are celebrating their five-year anniversary of the 2019 World Series tonight with the Astros in town. It's been five years. Yeah, last time Steven Strasburg did anything... Uh, Congratulations on a good career, Steven Strasburg, though. Hey, uh, they officially let him retire. Does that show you just how fast time goes, how it flies? Remember we were playing Baby Shark, dun, 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 Baby Shark? Yeah. Wow. That was Baby Shark. He's now the first base coach for them, I'm pretty sure. It's five years ago was Baby Shark. And now Gerardo Parra is the first base coach for the Nats. And when you think about it, when you think about it, it just goes to show with sports fans, the whole just win me a title and that's all I care about is a lie. The championships just become good memories. 
Yeah. Because fans, time moves on. Like, there was a time when the White Sox won 05. 05, yeah. And generations, the la- their last title was in the 50s. Wasn't it? Oh, I think it was longer than that. I think their last title was in the 50s. I thought they were like, they were. They had a longer drought than the Red Sox, I thought. No, because was... the Giants, the Giants, the Giants had a long, Giants hadn't also won since the 50s. I want to say the White Sox was in the 40s or the 50s. Uh, the Either White's... way, I wasn't around. Yeah, the White Sox won the World Series last in 1917. So 1917. So, people said then that's all that matters. I just want to see one title, right? And that was cool in 05. And then there's 08. And then there's 2012. And then there's 2017. And then, now we're in 2024, and no one even gives a crap. And they want everybody fired. Like, it just goes to show. These titles don't buy you forever. They don't buy you the honeymoon forever. They buy you... like. We we won't be that far away. I mean, remember Clay Thompson has to be a lifetime warrior. Oh, well, now you're playing right into the narrative of this offseason. That's all that everyone's talking about. Remember that? He's gonna look great in the purple and yellow next year. Remember that? What he's he's not gonna be a, a jailblazer. Yeah. They were oh. my they were my Portland jailblazers back in the day. Remember that nickname? Those were the great nicknames. But think about that. Remember that? He's, He's a- going to be a career, a career warrior. Is he? What does that sound? Somebody's. Oh, it's a Comrex. I have a oh, kind okay. of um, It just goes to show, like, did, didn't the Warriors build up enough with all the championships, the parades, and the Warriors that these guys deserve to be Warriors for the rest of their, the rest of their lives, no matter what, because of the joy? That's the talk. That's what I always heard. Now, all of a sudden, Clay's got to be gone. What to do with Draymond? Uh, well, he, well, it goes to show, don't tell. Giants won three World Series. Now there's people, I want that guy fired. That guy gone. Championships don't buy you any time. Time, you can't buy time. Baseball tries to buy time. People try and, we're going to rebuild, remodel, replenish, whatever re you want to do. Restructure, retool. Bottom line, time, you don't got it. You don't got time. Win as many championships as you want. Tom Brady won how many championships? Seven. Six with them, right? Oh, with New England, yes. He won six with New England. Next, you know, he's a Tampa Bay Buccaneer. How much does winning do for you? They traded Joe Montana, won four Super Bowls. Four Super Bowls, three-time Super Bowl MVP, traded him. To Kansas City. So what do championships really – so when fans call up to Sports Talk Radio and talk about championships, do they really mean it? Do they really mean it? What does time buy you? We're celebrating the 2019 Nats. A lot has happened since then. I like the Nats, so I think they're a good young club. They're fun. Yeah, they got some guys coming through their system. I there, said it. Too. People thought I was crazy. Well, they left here and went took two out of three from L.A. That would be the Dodgers, not the Orange County who want to act like they're L.A., kind of like the Oakland Airport that wants to be the San Francisco <laughs> Oakland Airport now. That drama. Have you been reading about yes. that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Orange County is not Los Angeles. I don't know if you know that. Uh, yes, since my wife's from the area, yes. Yeah. Orange yeah. County and L.A. are not the same at all. Like nothing about it, say politically, um, the governments, the taxes, nothing. They're two different areas. Somehow the Angels have blended it into one. But then again, neither of the New York Giants and New York Jets, they both play in New Jersey. The Meadowlands. <laughs> I've been there. It's not New York. It's in the marsh, it's in the marshes of New Jersey. They don't play. The Detroit Pistons for years played in Auburn. Auburn Hills, yeah. The Auburn Hills, yeah. The Palace. Wasn't that the Palace? Yeah, Palace of Auburn Hills, yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how many teams don't win. San Francisco 49ers, where do they play? Santa Clara. Santa Clara, as a government and a political body and everything that makes up a city, is not San Francisco. Hell, Candlestick Park, wasn't that in South San Francisco? Yeah, pretty much. I don't even know where I'm going with it. Yeah. The whole point is time. You think you got time when you win? Time by 
You don't, you don't really buy time because fans will always expect every single year. It's a what have you done for me lately world. We win a championship. I've waited my whole life. Five years later, fire that guy, fire that guy. That guy's old. Get him out of here. It's how we work as fans. A championship is never, don't, I, I will never buy the, the, a championship will satisfy the masses. No, you'll turn, the masses will turn on you in no time. The only guy, the only thing I could think of before we get to Kotze, the only guy, guy or team I could think of is how many years did Mike Sosha live with the Angels after winning that one World Series? I mean, he was there for, or Doug Wilson with the Sharks. Yeah. Well, they never won. There's a difference. They won a lot of games, though. Yeah, well, not this year. And that and that Doug Wilson lasted a long. I mean, very few people last a long time. Yeah, Mike Sosha was there forever. Yeah, it was like he ended up being done in what eighteen or nineteen, something like that. So, by the way, how much have they won since he's left? Uh, yeah, no, no, no. I, you know what? You bring the, and I know we got to get to Cots eight. Bring this up. I, I found it very odd the other night. I'm watching Quick Pitch. They're playing the Rays. It's the, it's the uh, game Trout went oppo bomb on the inside fastball. Went oppo bomb. You're like, ooh, Trout's back. Um, where I found myself rooting for the Angels because of Wash. I was like, I'd like check myself. It's like, oh my God, I hate these guys, but it's Wash. You aren't rooting for him for the rally monkey? Where's the rally monkey? I don't even know where the rally Oh, there he is. I cannot believe I was watching the highlights rooting for Wash. I love the man. I want to see Wash do well. I hate the Angels, but I want to see Wash do well. I was actually like, uh, you know, I'm watching the highlights, and I want—I don't know who won the game, right? You watch the highlights, and they're going through the, you know, quick pitch does it, and they have all the different announcers and everything. They do a really good job. And I'm like, I was pulling for the Halos, and I hate the Halos. Is that weird? No, because you're rooting for a specific person, not a team. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that's fine. Rendon got a hit. I was like, "Gee, what, what, what universe are we in?" Ron Washington is the manager of the Angels, and Rendon got a hit. Rendon, I thought it was the 2019 World Series again. Oh, too soon. Wow. <laughs> Speaking of 2019, uh, Mark Kotze show right here on A's. You ready? Yeah. You ready? Yep. Mark Kotze show right here on A's Cast Live. For the Mark Kotze show brought to you by nestbedding.com. Love where you sleep. Of course, they have the location in the Bay Area. But if you need your mattress, your pillows, your sheets, whatever, you go to nestbedding.com. Mark Kotze, how are you? Doing well. We um we're in Cleveland. There's a, a gray cloud over the stadium, slight chance of rain, <laughs> oh fifties. <laughs> Doing great. It's Cleveland. <laughs> well, it was just 80 degrees here, kind of like when we came home to Oakland last homestand. I think it was like 80 degrees the day before we got there, and then it was, you know, in the low 50s. We had a nice Wednesday day game, though. It was beautiful on the on the Wednesday day game. Well, I got to tell you, I'm pretty excited. I, I know as a manager, you're, you're going to say you'd like to be 500 or better, but when you look at your team after the start, and the way they have played, I think you got to be excited for what you've seen. Yeah, you know, I, I think obviously the, the one in one in six homestand to start the year um, wasn't how we wanted to get out of the gate. But uh, that following road trip, as we talked about last time, last Friday, you know, we turned things around. You know, defensively, we played better. Um, our pitching has been pretty good, pretty solid. Uh, offensively, we still, you know, have a lot, lot of work to do. Um, but you know. Combining the pitching and the defense and scoring enough runs has given us a, a, a decent start to a season where, um, you know, we we know we can compete. And, uh, you know, this road trip will be a real test. This road trip coming here to Cleveland, this club's 13 and 6, I think. Um, they've yeah. played really good baseball. They're fundamentally sound. They don't strike out. They put the ball in play. They're aggressive on the base pass. So, uh, and then we step into New York uh, and then on to Baltimore. So, two of the biggest, you know, East teams. Uh, expected to win that division so it's a it's a pretty good 10-day road trip it's going to be a good challenge for sure you know if you take away that first home stand let's start with the starting staff you have one of the best pitchers starters eras in baseball talk about take away that homes the first home stand what you've seen with your starters 
Yeah, you know, I think they're they're definitely managing games, um, giving us the best opportunity to get to the bullpen, which I think we can talk to later. But, um, you know, the starting pitching with the experience they have, they know how to manage games. They know how to manage innings. I think the biggest thing last year we saw was obviously our inability to throw strikes. But behind the inability to throw strikes was the, the anxiety to get, you know, when an inning started to spiral, it wasn't about just getting out. It was like, how am I going to get out of this? How am I not going to give up a run? And then it just kept escalating. And I think these guys now have an understanding, including JP. Like JP's really matured. And in that mindset, now like, okay, lead off double. I'm all right with a ground ball out to the right side. I'm all right with, you know, maybe giving up one. And before it was like, okay, I need to strike this next guy out. Ball four. Now it's first and second. Boom. Base hit. Now it's second and third or first and third without it getting out and, and out. And I think they've really done a great job with managing games in that way. And then you look at the bullpen. We can even count the homestand. Your bullpen right now is third in all of baseball in ERA. What a change. Just what is the confidence like from last year to this year, the difference for you in your bullpen? Uh, again, I mean, we we are um, throwing more strikes in the bullpen. I think having Mason Miller on the back end has really just kind of brought a, a calmness to the rest of the guys, um, a sense of confidence down there. Uh, you know, the relievers getting out to a good start, um, the veteran mix down there uh, with a guy like TJ McFarland coming into us right at the right at the start of the season with his experience level, um, his knowledge, uh, Austin Adams, another guy with experience and being in those positions in that, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth kind of leverage spot, you know, um, they've done a great job. And then you add in the Lucy, you know, the Lucas Ursigs, the Danny Jimenez, um, you know, and you can't leave out Kyle Muller and, and, and Mitch Spence that those mm -hmm. two guys, the innings that they've been able to provide when our starters haven't gotten into games, um, the success they've had, um, you know, I think it's, it's just all kind of aligned really well. Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned Kyle Muller. I love him. I think he's going to be a big part of your future. Mitch Spence, the Rule 5 pick. I mean, you talk about you're starting five, unfortunately. They won't be able to go the entire season. At some point, human being, something happens. It's like you have a really good insurance policy right now. Well, both those guys, Spence and Muller, have thrown, you know, enough length, um, you know, to be able to step in. It may take them a start or two to get really stretched out, but um, – no, you know, there is some depth there right now with with um, those two individuals. We've got some guys that are starting to throw their pins now, starting to look like uh, we may get, you know, a Ken Waldachuk back when his 60 day time frames up. Um, same thing with the Luis Medina, who's throwing a pin today that that uh, these two guys that are starters that have been in our rotation. Um, you know, there's even more depth, you know, hopefully to come. I mean, that's just the Ken Waldachuk, the fact that I saw him the other day thrown in the bullpen. You just think about the bracket surgery. It's a different type, I guess, of Tommy John surgery using the bracket. Isn't it amazing how fast guys are healing now? Well, it is. And it is also amazing that how fast guys are getting hurt at an alarming rate, right? And I know that's something that's been discussed nationally um, over the last, <clears throat> over the start of the season. So with the injuries that have kind of, you know, stacked up. but. Again, um, you know, modern medicine, technology, um, advancements, um, you know, are all uh, really helpful in, in, in our world of, of recovery. Mason Miller, when he comes in, it's just electric. What's it like for you guys in the dugout when he comes in pumping 102, 103 and that amazing slider? Yeah, I, again, I talked about it a minute ago. There's, there's a lot of confidence there. Um, you know, it's it's something that we haven't had over the last two seasons here. Um, and, you know, if we can continue to maintain, um, you know, his health and just keeping him uh, healthy for the rest of the season and this bullpen, you know, we can have a good mix with with roles that have started to develop that I uh, feel really confident once we have a lead. Um, late, And it's not going to happen every time. It's baseball. You know, we're going to have some hiccups down there. Um, but you know, knock on wood, these guys can stay healthy and, and continue to have the success they've had so far.
It's like the shiny new toy on Christmas morning. You want to play with it every single day. Is it going to be hard for you to go, wow, I got another lead. I really want to get this win. Is it going to be hard for you not to get him up and bring him in? No, because I always take the long you know, term look. I mean, you know, it's it's more important to have him for 162 games as it is to to win one game in April. Uh, I mean, every win matters. I get it, but um, stressing this kid at this point in the season, coming off you know an elbow issue last season, just there's no reward in that in my mind. And um, and I think you know we both agree, him and myself, that uh, we'd rather have him for you know 50 plus appearances, 45, 50 plus appearances than you know. 20 in April and and him being, you know, out for um, some time. Eric Martins, I went up to him the other day during, before uh, before BP. He was working with the guys. I said, hey, do you know who leads all of baseball and double plays turn? He goes, no. I go, you do. And I go, that, that says a lot from where this was at the start of the year leading the world in airs to now playing really, really good defense. I don't know if you're leading it anymore. I know you're at the very top, but just talk about what he has done and the change in defense and what it's done for your club. Well, I think, you know, that first homestand, I, I don't ever want to, you know, make excuses for these guys. And this isn't an excuse. They just came out tight. They came out <laughs> with a level of expectation. Maybe they weren't used to. And, um, you know, they finally got settled down, like I talked about on the road trip. And and we know we can play defense. And I think we saw, you know, since that stretch and, and, and as you, you know, talk about the number of double plays we've turned, um, an improvement that, that was more of our expectation level. And, um, you know, EMAR drills them every day. They go out, they do their footwork. They really work hard on their glove presentation. Um, you know, and, and it's not for a lack of effort or lack of work. And I talked about that during the homestand when, when I was questioned, you know, do you guys do early work? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, we do. And we do it a lot. Um, but it's also a tribute to the pitching staff, right? I mean, we're getting those double plays because we're getting the ball on the ground. And there's a lot of success when you get the ball on the ground and keep it out of the air from a pitching side, too. So, um, you know, I think, you know, overall, um, you know, we're going to continue to, to, you know, allow Emar, you know, to go out and, and and work these guys and continue just to improve. Are you saying you guys just don't show up 20 minutes before the game, roll the balls out and go? Yeah, that's pretty much what I'm saying. So, <laughs> you, know, you always see MLB TV, they'll always show like the Orioles or the Yankees and they're out there doing early work and, yeah. you know, but uh, no, rest assured, I promise you that we're, we're working every day. Yeah, no doubt the defense, uh, it, it's been a lot of fun to watch. And speaking of defense, you, you mentioned early the challenge that you're going to have in this upcoming series. You've already seen Cleveland. You know they like to run. You win up against the Nationals, who they just end up having a good series after playing the Athletics. They had a good series down at Dodger Stadium. You faced quite, you fit quite a bit. You faced teams already to start the year. It's like a track meet. So, what is that like for Shea Langoliers, for McCann, from a catching standpoint? And also for your pitchers, it's got to be, hey, we need a little giddy up and we got to get faster to home play. Yeah, I mean, let's start with the pitchers, right? It's their responsibility to try to keep their times under one, three, five. And we stress that. We continue to stress that. We've tried to implement it in the minor leagues, you know, and, and, and there's a balance to it. I understand that there's an importance of executing a pitch, but there's also an importance of keeping the runner off second base and out of scoring position. So, you know, we're fortunate to have Shea Langliers behind the play. His pop times are, you know, one seven five, one eight, which really, you know, makes up for the lack of, you know, a, a pitcher's time and also the arm strength that he's shown um, over the course of these, you know, two seasons with us now. Um, is is above average. So the Nationals came in. They tried it early on uh, on game one to run on them. I think he threw two guys out. And uh, outside of that, they pretty much shut it down um, other than, I think, a, a, a stolen base, a third base. Um, and, you know, uh, Max got, you know, his work cut out for him. He, he did throw a runner out last start, which was nice to see. He threw a nice throw right on the bag. Um, you know, but this was a team that when Mac caught, they, these guys ran, I think, four or five times that game. They challenged him. Um, so we're going to have to be cognizant if, if, uh, if you know, Kyle starts one of these games to really do a great job with, you know, when we pick, uh, the timing of our picks, uh, varying our, our, our looks to second base. 
um, you know, all of those things, that, which is what Marcus Jensen and myself, you know, really, um, really work on prior to, you know, going out for this series. Let's end on this, you know, the old expression, iron sharpens iron. How good is this going to be for the young players for the first time go to New York City to play at Yankee Stadium? And then you mentioned the Orioles, who they're built to be one of the best teams in baseball. Kind of to measure yourself early on the road. You start out well on the road. What's this going to be like for your club, especially the young guys? No, I love that you brought that up because what I'm trying to do here is is with these young guys, allow them to understand that the game is the game. Nothing changes. You know, you, you play the game the same way, whether it's the first out of the game or the 27th out of the game, you know, and, and try to understand that mindset, that mental approach um, of, of just a relaxed state. Right. And and understanding, you know, that from pitch one, uh, you know, the effort level, the concentration level, everything stays the same. It's it's just the game. And uh, that's the way we need to approach this this uh, 10 game road trip is that, you know, we're playing baseball. And regardless of the opponent on the other side, we have to control what we control and and how we play the game. It doesn't matter what the back of the jersey says. The name on the back of the jersey does not matter. Where you're you're a big leaguer now, like you're on the same playing field. Let's take that mindset. Let's go out and compete. If we don't win today, turn the page. Come back tomorrow with the same expectation level to go compete and win a game. So that's that's really what I'm trying to instill here. And I think that that's the most important thing we can you know take away from this trip. I'm excited. It's a lot better baseball. We're having a lot more fun doing the show than we did last year. All right, we'll talk to you next week. Good luck on this road trip. The Mark Otze Show brought to you by Nest Betting. Love where you sleep. Go to nestbetting.com. Check out their location in the Bay Area for all of your betting needs. The Mark Kotze Show, that's going to do it for A's Cast Live. Thank you to Mark Kotze. Thank you to Tom Hamilton, Stephen Kwan, and Fran Reardon, the leader of men, the manager of the Las Vegas Aviators, A's, Guardians next, right here on A's Cast and the A's Radio Network. This is Chris Townsend. I'm proud to announce our year two partnership with Link Soul. They've changed my wardrobe and they can do the same for you. And right now their spring collection is fabulous. Natural fabrics and versatile styles, perfect for this time of the year. And they want to introduce their performance line for golf premium for on-course apparel design and to keep you cool and drive. Check it all out, linksoul.com. That's linksoul.com. Remember, look good, play good. Where does one community end and the next begin? Across the railroad tracks? On the other side of the river? Is it between the east side and the west side? At Comerica Bank, we believe it's all one community, and we're all part of it. That's why Comerica has invested over $20 million for affordable housing, financial education, and workforce development in lower income communities. Because when we raise expectations for everyone, we all rise. Member FDIC, Equal Opportunity Lender. If you haven't been to the Chicken Pie Shop in Walnut Creek, what are you waiting for? You're going to love the new menu, and it's a great place to watch all the games. Come taste their world-famous chicken pie that has been served in Southern California for 86 years. They have a new spring menu with special dishes and a full bar with new delicious spring cocktails. Spacious indoor and outdoor dining, perfect for your next corporate party or birthday celebration. Don't forget free parking. For more information, go to chickenpieshopwc.com. That's chickenpieshopwc.com. Nestled in the hills of San Jose, minutes from Silicon Valley, Cinnabar Hills Golf Club offers 27 holes of championship golf, a first-class pro shop, practice facility, and great food in the grill. This time of year also means family and business get-togethers. Let the folks at Cinnabar Hills make your event unforgettable while enjoying their award-winning venue. It's all there for you, championship golf, a great space for any events, and incredible food. See it all at CinnabarHills.com. That's CinnabarHills.com. With an advanced network, cybersecurity solutions, and trusted partnership, Comcast Business powers more businesses than anyone. Comcast Business, powering possibilities. Get started with internet and security for your small business for $49.99 a month for 12 months with a two-year contract. Plus, ask how to get up to an $800 prepaid card with qualifying internet. Call today. It's 5524. Restrictions apply. New customers only with 50 megabits per second internet and security edge. EcoBill and auto pay required. Equipment, taxes, and fees extra. This has been a presentation of the Oakland Athletics.